When is the last time you listened to a podcast about web development, web design, and small business and didn't fall asleep? Yes, we cover web development, web design, and small business, but like actual human beings with personalities. If you're a beginner, we're not going to talk over your head. It's more like asking your buddy for help. We have guests, we have fun, and let me tell you, these two can get off on a tangent. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to HTML All The Things Podcast. This is Matt Lawrence and Mike Curran. That's right, everybody. We're back. This is episode 103, Top 10 Tips for Working From Home. I'm Matt, that's Mike, and this week we'll be discussing, I mean, very... Obviously, our top 10 tips from working from home. Uh, Then we'll be discussing our new streaming content plan in our web news. Now, if this sounds interesting to you and you want to support the show, you can go and check us out on Patreon, leave a review or rating on the podcast app you're listening to this on, join us in our Discord server, or share this with your friends. And now it's time for our weekly pain points. So, Mike, please take it away. All right. Uh, My weekly pain point this week is just too much tech. Uh, This is in reference to just how many tech stacks that I'm working with right now. Um, and it's becoming a little bit overwhelming. So like I've got, you know, uh, review, or my regular Vue.js stuff that I have to do. Then I'm also doing some stuff in Laravel, um, just very small minor things. I'm kind of only overseeing a project there, but I still have to know a little bit about it. Uh, I have a Flutter projects that I'm working on. Uh, I can't even remember anymore. Like I, I have regular JavaScript with some jQuery um then i have cordova like cross-platform developments anyway and this is like what i do in a week not like you know what i've been working on over the last few months like those are the things that i have to switch between in a week and it's kind of frying my brain a little bit um i've got to figure out a way to rein it all in and make it a little bit more manageable for myself uh but yeah that's what i'm struggling with this week what about you matt well jesus um well just before i do my weekly pain point and before i forget uh, if you're listening to this hot off the heels of its release specifically, so you know immediately after we release this episode, uh, you probably have a few more hours-ish to uh, join our giveaway. So we announced it a few weeks ago. We brought it up last week. We d- we put it on the Twitter, of course, and it just just like sort of a final reminder right now that we do have a Twitter giveaway. Entries are accepted until July 23rd, 2020 at 12 a.m. EST. That is the cutoff time. So just a reminder, go to our Twitter. It's pinned to the profile. It gives you all the rules and everything of how to enter. And you uh, will be entered to win a free premium course by West Boss. So um, anyway, my weekly pain point, I suppose, just a sort of very roughly transition, is uh, business growing pains. So our web news will kind of touch on this. But we've been doing some, we've just been doing, it, it's growing, it's pivoting, it's, not, I don't know if it's pivoting, but it's like, it's growing, it's changing, it's just sort of being uh, more flexible. Um, we've just talked about how we want to just do more uh, for Hat and how we're actually going to do it now. I know we've said this in the past, like, hey, we're going to do more, we're going to do more. But now we've had like a, you know, a very serious discussion and, you know, we've already started streaming, so that's, like, a big piece for us anyway. I know it's, I know, like, for some people, we be like, well, you're not live every day. But, like, I mean, we're also, as Mike has just said, doing a million other things. But uh, we're looking at potentially sort of pivoting my role to an extent for, like, hat stuff like that. And uh, for, like, hat content. And so I'm not going to go into the weeds of it right now, but just it's just been that. Just a lot of reorganizing, thus of talking, thinking, those type of things. Uh, and we'll get into that in our web news. But um, uh, Mike actually wrote these uh, these top ten tips, and uh, I'm going to let him sort of take them over. So, Mike, please, sir, take it away. Okay. Uh, so what we're going to be talking about today is top ten tips for working from home. Uh, just something that I've been thinking about a lot because, again, I've been working from home for a really long time and then with the shift to for most people actually probably listening to us are now working from home because we're not an essential workers especially if you're working in the web development industry it's just I don't I don't see a reason for you at this point with covid going on to be in the office so most of you are probably going through a transition maybe you've already been working from home for a while and I just hope that some of the tips that I've been using and uh, some of the tips that I just kind of made up myself will help you. So let's get right into it here. Uh, tip number one, set defined work hours. Now, 
I'm not saying like set, you know, I'm going to be nine to five every day. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying set some sort of a schedule for yourself and that you can communicate out to your team that's flexible, but make sure it's defined. So uh, for instance, you know, some people work better in the evenings. Uh, some people work better in the mid afternoon. So it's not like, you know, some people work better from the 12 to nine range. Some people work better from the 3 PM to like 12 AM range or something like that. Like people have different work hours, but if you set yourself with defined work hours, it's easier for you to control communication. It's easier for you to control your daily life. Like if someone reaches out to you and asks you to do something, you have a, a better answer for them than being like, I don't know, because when you start working from home, let's face it, uh, you kind of start working all the time. Because you're answering emails all the time, you're, uh, and you know, checking your checking your messages. You're just you know thinking of a thing that you can code and going to your desk at like random times to code that up. And that's not good for most people, including the company, even because it those kinds of work hours are less focused and less productive. I've noticed um, a couple studies come out recently where they've said that the shift from home has made people work longer but their effectiveness has gone down. It's mostly because of this reason. Like they're working a lot, but their focus is not there because they don't have any set defined structure to their life. So when you have a little bit of structure and again, be flexible with it. Like, you know, if you set your eight to five and then, you know, you need to do something that day and it doesn't fall into that eight to five range, then you can't just, you know, you make it, make it so that you can, uh, change it up a little bit here and there, but try to keep around it. That's kind of what I would say. Um, having said that, I want to move on to the next one because it ties into this one real quick. Keep your team updated with to your status. So if you have those set defined work hours, make sure your team knows those hours. And if you change your work hours that day, be like, hey, you know, message them in your group chat, message them in an email saying like, hey, I'll be, you know, I won't be around for these two hours. I have a doctor's appointment or I won't be around these two hours. I have personal reasons, whatever. Like you don't have to tell them what you're doing, uh, in my opinion. It's whatever you want to do uh, as long as you get your work done. But make sure that they're updated with it because you don't want to receive any sort of emergency emails or like, why aren't you at your desk messages when you're still doing your work, but you just stepped out for a little while, those messages always kind of interrupt whatever you're doing and they make you feel bad. It just doesn't make sense. And for your team's sake, it's better for them to know because they can work around their uh, blockers, like their stuff that they need to do that relies on you with your hours, especially if they know in advance. Um, it could be a day in advance. You can give them a weekly schedule, whatever you want to do. But it's nice for your team to know what your hours are like. Uh, so that they can work around your schedule as well. So they don't have to bug you when you're off. Uh, so they don't have to, you know, rely on you and then you not being there, stuff like that. Uh, and, and I will say too, um, kind of stepping back to the, the, the defined work hours is like, I, I'm sort of bounce around uh, a fair bit, but my kind of definition of a day is just sort of like, I'm going to do X amount of hours today, or it will be specifically, I'm going to do this task today. I'm going to do this task today. And, you know, if I get that task done in four hours and there's nothing else pertinent, then whatever. If I get, if I was planning on the task taking eight hours, it only took four hours, then I can either have, you know, I could take those other four hours off or I could get ahead on something. And usually what I'll do is I'll just get ahead on, on something. I'll get ahead on whatever it is, uh, the, a po the podcast edit, or I'll get ahead on communicating or I'll just send all my emails out or I'll prepare for something so I don't have to do it the next day. Um, of course, I could always just take that time off if it's like been a stressful day or a stressful week or whatever. So like the def the, like the defined, I don't know if Mike's already mentioned it, but the defined work hours really don't have to be, I'm going to be at the office from eight to four or whatever. It, it really can be, I'm going to complete X task today. Like this task and this task, these are the ones I'm going to kill off today. And obviously, the flexible as it is with all project planning, if something goes horribly wrong and you can't complete it, you can't complete it. But assuming normal circumstance, oh, I completed these two tasks today, you know, I can kind of take off, whatever. Uh, there's been times where, you know, plans an evening and like the first task takes longer so that you, you leave, but then I'll just come back later. I'm crazy. Like I'll edit the podcast at five in the morning. Like I'm, I'm one that doesn't care, but my structure is the task itself. Oh, I need to schedule this today. I'll just go schedule it. And, uh, and I will postpone things, you know, if I do get up early or something, I'm not going to be staying up till 5am necessarily, but 
Uh, I will postpone things, of course, as needed, as with all project planning, but I just, I don't worry about the clock too much. I just worry about, okay, this, this, and this needed to get done. That already got done. It's like no one's sitting there being like, hey, you need to be here for six hours because I know for sure that there's days where I'll just be sitting at the desk for 16 hours. Like There are those days and I fully acknowledge that. And so it's just a matter of being like, oh. Like, uh, like I was talking to Mike today, like we're actually recording this on a different day than we normally do. And it, I was available because yes, I have stuff to do and I still, I'm still doing it, but it's stuff that isn't specifically time sensitive. It's not time sensitive to the minute it's time sensitive to the day. And so I'm already well on my way to finishing it, for example. And so that, even though this is like a quote unquote flexible interruption, I guess you could say. It just doesn't matter because now, now the time, because we normally record tomorrow in this particular case. So now that time, I just, I'll just spend the time on the task I was going to do today at this time tomorrow. Like, so that's just sort of an example of how I move it around. And Mike and I have actually had this conversation. I'm sure we'll get into this in the web news as well is I'm a person that I'm better at just kind of bouncing around all over the place because I get this, I get a weird mentality of being like, Jesus, like I got to sit here for eight hours and if it's just like a grueling, like whatever, sometimes it just needs to get done. If it's due that day, of course, you know, there's going to be grueling days, but sometimes it just doesn't make sense for me to sit here for the full eight. Sometimes I'll do it for four and then I'll go hang out with some buddies online or something. They all have, you know, normal day jobs for the most part. They all leave, go to bed. And then like, I have no problem doing another four hours at two in the morning. And to some people, they might be like, that's terrible for your health or whatever, but I am still sleeping. Like my sleep time is variable as well. And again, maybe there's problems there, but I'm a person that does sort of thrive in that environment where I prefer to say, oh, you know, I don't think I'm going to be around tomorrow at five or uh, actually a a better, a better actual example rather than a, you know, a theoretical one is regularly I'm unavailable when the podcast releases, like on the actual time the podcast releases. So one of the things is it's like, we need a scheduler and obviously we have one. And so I can finish it whenever now that task is complete just before the, the podcast time. And now I can be unavailable just because it's like right in the prime of the workday. So now I can be unavailable, be on a call, be doing X task, doing whatever the heck I need to do. But another task is like kind of self-completing, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a benefit of the work from home scru- structure and also the, a benefit of having a small team, having... Your, like setting your own work schedule as well. So with us, myself and Matt, how we handle this kind of situation is I know Matt has this variable schedule. And if I need him for a certain amount of time at certain amount of, at, at a certain day, I will reach out to him before that, like maybe, you know, a day or two before that time. And I'll, we'll schedule a meeting or we'll schedule this podcast recording if it's at a different usual time and stuff like that. So that's kind of, kind of how we go around it and that you can for sure do that for uh, a lot of your even coworker situations. If you're more of a sporadic worker, if you're more, if you like to work like random hours throughout the day and adjust your day to your work, uh, that's something you can work out. But in a more team structure, it's a little bit more difficult. So when you have like five people that rely on you, it's tough to pin, like, you know, it's tough to separate your day out so that all five people can, can contact you in certain times if you don't have a set like a, like you know approximate hours that they can contact you on. So it works out like if if you're one of those people that like to work uh, different times during the day, like you you know you like to split up your day at like you know you start work at twelve, you end work at three, then you do whatever you want from three to like five or six or seven, and then you work at night. Um, that can definitely 100% be done when you work from home. But again, uh, it works better if you have less people that rely on you and less people that uh, you rely on as well. Because again, if you're if you're relying on someone that only works in the mornings uh, and you're an evening worker, that that kind of schedule can sometimes conflict. And we've had that with uh, with other contractors and stuff like that, where it's been a little bit difficult to reach out, especially with time zones. Like time zones is a big thing. Uh, reach out and collaborate and stuff like that. So it depends on your work structure. It depends on that. For me and Matt, it works perfectly uh, because again, I have a kind of a dual role at the company where I work mostly with one contract uh, and that contract is a very standard work environment where we have kind of a nine to five um, 
And then with Matt, we have like Matt's able to adjust his schedule to whatever my schedule is. So it works out perfectly in that kind of scenario. And so, and when you're talking mm-hmm. about time zones too, like I can easily reach almost any time zone. Like if I had to be, if I had to go on a call from five to 7 a.m., it's like, okay, then I'll just go to bed at 7 a.m. Like, I guess I just pulled a night shift then. Okay. Yeah. It doesn't bother me. And the interesting thing is that can be extremely useful in certain scenarios for management roles. Like if you're, if you're, uh, you know, managing a, a remote team, for instance, uh, you would need someone like you that can work in whatever times and can adjust the schedule to, to that management role rather than someone maybe like me where I, I prefer my like set schedule and I, I don't really like to, I can get up at 5 a.m. or 6 a.m. or I can just not go to sleep until like three or four, but I prefer to go to sleep in like a predefined time, mm-hmm. uh, like 11 or 12 or whatever. And that's just the way I work. And again, everyone's different. So you got to adapt to those roles and stuff like that. And it's really important to have diversity on your team sometimes so that people can take over certain things that you aren't comfortable with doing. So that works out with me and Matt really well, actually. Um, Having said that, let's move on to the next point here. This is point number three. Figure out your peak working hours and schedule meetings around them. So for me, meetings are a productivity killer. Um, they are a hundred percent a requirement in, in what I'm doing, uh, because I am working on so many different projects with a, a, like a wide variety of people. I have to make sure that they're moving forward with those projects and that I'm providing the support that they need and they're providing the support that I need. Uh, it's required to have meetings, but as well, like having said that it's also really important to make sure these meetings are short and as effective as possible so that I can get back to my deep work hours. So for me, I figured out that my hours where I do my best work, and I've mentioned this before, are between 8 a.m. and about 1 p.m. So in those hours, I usually try not to schedule meetings. Now, I do have some exceptions for working sessions because, again, that's kind of work. So in working sessions, uh, you're actually doing some coding together. You're doing some pair programming, stuff like that. I will schedule some of those in that time because I can do some troubleshooting on the fly better. But for like just basic checkup meetings or stand up meetings or uh, just, you know, get to know people meetings that I try to schedule after that 1 p.m. cutoff. And that seems to work great for me. And again, this is the kind of thing where I can't tell you what your best working hours are. Like I can't be like, you know, 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. is going to work for everyone. It's absolutely not. So you got to figure out your own peak time. And if you're more of an afternoon worker, then maybe you, you try to schedule or you do your best to schedule your meetings for the morning. Stuff like that. Obviously, you can't control everything. Sometimes you have to adjust to other people or other teams' uh, times. But if you have that flexibility, if you're able to schedule your own meetings, absolutely try to schedule them around your peak work hours because you're going to get way more done. You're not going to have to sit there in the evening or whatever, redoing a bunch of work or or, uh, finishing up your work for the day because you're going to have those peak work hours. Like I get more done from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m., then I would get done from like, you know, 1 p.m. to 9 p.m. Like that's how effective those hours are for me. Because for some reason, like for me, when I have my meetings after one, my productivity goes way down because I'm thinking about all the other stuff that I have to do because of the meetings and uh, I'm trying to organize all that. And I do more of my, like my, you know, organizational stuff, my uh, check-in stuff during the post peak work hours. And that usually works out for me because I get enough done during those four or five hours in the, in the morning that uh, I can continue to kind of, you know, chip away at the rest of the stuff that I didn't get done during the day, but not as effectively. Yeah, so, I, I, mm-hmm. will say, I will say in, you know, in my experience, um, one of the things that we used to do in the beginning, Mike, when we used to just talk to like, because everyone at that point was a new client because it was the beginning. And we would just say like, oh, we're available on Wednesday. Or, you know, we're available Monday and Tuesday, but we wouldn't give a specific time. And one of the most effective ways actually to get someone to do a meeting or at least to give you a time, because usually the usually the request comes in and says, we should do a meeting next week. And it's like, oh, OK. So what I do is I, I do all my meetings in the afternoon and I specifically cater it, but I always give a range. So I'll be like, oh, I'm available Monday and Tuesday from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. Because that's the best time for me, because I'm a person where I wake up later, obviously, because I'm working late. I wake up later, and then I, I like to just sit there with my coffee, and I answer emails and texts and and those type of things. But I don't have like a conversation. Then I kind of go to the office, turn on the computer, and then I'm ready to sort of do a meeting. And that'll be, 
you know, the best time is the best time is like slightly after I begin, you know, because I'm like starting to work and stuff like that. I don't want to put it with a computer and just like eff- effectively jump into a a Zoom call. But it's like, you know, I sort of establish myself, get all my windows open and stuff like that that I need for the call and then jump into the call. So sort of afternoon to early evening ish is usually the best time. And the best thing you can do, I think, is just presenting those times because the wind they're not just win like they're they're not just one hour windows because like that that feels like you're you're telling the person i'm only available for these two hours it's it's giving the person still a bunch of choice and they'll often just sort of be like okay like there's a four hour slot here i'll just do it or we've had people actually suggest later because maybe they do a day job and the thing we're doing for them is for their side hustle and so they've they've asked us like hey can we do six and so they will cater even their time if it doesn't fit within your window to be near your window. And the window makes it so that you don't look as busy. So just as a brief sort of tip, if you will, um, if you, if you present yourself as like being super busy, that person will, ha- will be less likely to contact you, which can be good depending on the client. Cause some people are more hands on, some are more hands off and that's up to you. Like we can't tell you that, but, if it's a person that's a little more hands-on or if it's at the beginning of the project in which it doesn't matter what type of person they are, they need to be more hands-on to an extent. If you present yourself as being super busy, they might just go and find somebody else. So giving those windows is like, oh, I got like a four hour slot. Like this is like his, this is like his slot that he's allotting for me. And then he'll allot like a two hour or one hour slot within that four or five hours that he's allotted. So I just find that the being specific with when you want to do the meetings But giving a window is just like critical. And then just don't schedule anything else in that window other than just work that isn't super time sensitive. If the meeting only takes 20 minutes and you allotted five hours, now you have a whole bunch of time to do post-meeting stuff. Like Mike saying, organize all the stuff, take a break or, or you can, I mean, there's so much time that you could do both or you can like take an hour off, two hours off. And then come back and go and do another another thing. You can go and just start working on somebody else's project. Just start your you know you're a web dev. Go start start up that script you were supposed to write. Go make that page you were supposed to do. Go fix that CSS bug or whatever you needed to do. Yeah, I agree. I, I think giving people windows is much better than pigeonholing them into like you know I'm I'm available for thirty minutes on Tuesday and then next month I'm available for an hour like that that to me would be like, okay, so you don't have time for me. So I don't need, like, we can't, like this relationship won't work. Whereas if you're like, I'm available pretty much all the time between one to five, I have a few times that like, you know, I have other meetings scheduled, but just send me your times, like send me a few times between that. Um, that's usually a much more like, you know, approachable kind mm-hmm. of way. So yeah, you're definitely, you're definitely right. It's a good, it's a good approach. And again, like my window for meetings is anytime between one and 7 PM, essentially, like I'll take a meeting, uh, between those times and usually people can accommodate again you have to be flexible there's certain situations that will require you to go into your coding time or to your productive time and that's okay as long as it's not happening every day and it's not a regular thing i i have a an off topic but yet related thing so you're talking about approachability <clears throat> one of the most unapproachable things and i'm sure we've done this as well is for repairman so like you and I are obviously in the web dev industry and occasionally we're playing repairman, if you will, repairing someone's old website or broken website. But I'm talking more specifically about like the repairman, which you call to like fix X thing, like your washer, your dryer, the most unapproachable thing they can do for me. And this drives me like, like this actually drives me insane is when they go like, I don't know. Um, Oh, we have a problem with our, I'm making something up. We have a problem with our dryer. It like makes this banging noise. And then they come look, and they're like, oh, I've never, I've never seen this before. And it's like, well, I didn't go to Narnia to pick a dryer out and then like take it through the Stargate, get it like changed by an alien race and then come back, brought it here. And then something broke down. It's like, I went to the, the Leon's or whatever furniture outlet it was or appliance outlet, bought the dryer, brought it here. You probably got it delivered, got it professionally installed. I mean, somebody must know what this is and it's making this noise. And I know that you and I have done this a few times, but I try, I catch myself now where I just go like, oh, it kind of sounds like this. Like I kind of just like tell them my first level of troubleshooting in my, in my head in like consumer terms, because there's nothing more unsettling than it's like, does this guy, A, does this guy know what he's doing? And B, if you've worked with this guy before and, 
and like um you know he's done good work for you hypothetically in this hypothetical and he's done good work for you you now know what now you know that he knows what you're doing but it's like then i think like am i the idiot like did, what what did i purchase and i know that yeah. they're not saying that to be unapproachable that's probably just their their first thing they're like i've never I've never seen this before but at the same time my thought is well i i didn't do anything special so what do you mean <laughs> So, you know, when I say that, I say that when I don't want to do the thing, (laughs) like, to be honest. Yeah, it's it's almost, yeah, it's not, it's almost the exact that it's it's exactly like trying to push that task away from me. Like, um, if it's something to do with IT at this point, or if it's something to do with develop DevOps stuff that I don't want to do. And people ask me that and I've never seen it. I'll be like, oh man, I've never seen that before. And my hope in my mind, and it's probably not the right way to go about it is that they won't ask me to fix it or like they'll ask someone else. <laughs> oh my God. Like that's bad. It's bad, but maybe that's what they're doing to you. Like they just don't want to fix that kind of problem. God. I don't know. Okay. So another thing that I really hate, and again, I'm going off on a tangent here, um, but another thing for approachability that I really hate is when the repair guy or the store gives you a ridiculous time frame as well. So like I, my oh, dad, yeah. my dad recently called to get the barbecue fixed. And he called a few places. One place said that they don't have anyone available, like, at all for six months to fix a barbecue. Six months? So, yeah. make sure that barbecue season has ended, clean your barbecue, put it yeah. away, and then reopen it for me yeah. so I can fix it and then reclose it again. In my opinion, like, that's <laughs> – it's, it's disrespectful to say that. Kind of, like, just tell them that, like, we, we don't fix, fix barbecues or tell them that, like, we, we're just booked up forever. Yeah, we're booked. That's fair. Yeah, we're like, booked sorry, now. we're yeah. booked for this Don't season. give them a six-month – like, that's, that to me says, like, you're an idiot. Why are you calling me kind of thing. That, that's, my, that's my pet peeve. And I, I had this exact same thing happen to me in a local, uh, in a local tire repair center. Um, and then it's a big chain across the country. I'm not going to name it. But big tire repair chain across the country. I went in there. And I need I all I needed was my like my all seasons to be flipped to my winters. It's a maybe a twenty minute task or a fifteen minute task. Uh, and I went in there and I went it came up to the desk and I'm like, okay, can I get this done? They're like, well, we have we have a lineup. You're gonna it's gonna take about six hours. And I'm like, six hours to get the okay, whatever. Like, okay, that's fine. Uh, can I just come back? They're like, no, you have to stay in line for six hours in the store. You can't roam the store. So I'm like, so you're telling me I can't get my tires changed? They're like, no, like you, how you can do it. You just have to stand here for six hours. Six hours for six. I'm like, so just tell me you can't do it. Just tell me it's not like (laughs) today is not a good day. It's really busy. I just come back another day. Maybe come back in the morning. Like, give me a tip on how I can avoid the six hour wait. Don't tell me that I'm gonna wait in one spot for six hours. That's disrespect. I don't know. To me, that's that's the disrespect for some reason. I hate it. I hate it when people tell me unreasonable uh, time frames. If they like suffix it or like prefix it, it's fine. If if you say, "Hey, we're pretty booked up," it's going to be six months. Then it's like, okay, this person is acknowledging that what they're about to say and what they did say was ridiculous, and you know we we might want to go elsewhere. And then you know, oftentimes they'll say, you know, next time call in the off season or like, you know, come in at eight a.m. or like a yeah, solution or, or go to our competitor. Sometimes they'll even do that. Yeah. Go to our Don't competitor. S- like not stand here for six hours. That's not a solution. Like, hate that. It's uh, I, I, you know, what? I'm gonna. I'm, there's another tangent, real small one. Okay, we had a we had a major like plumbing problem down here like a while ago. Um, we had like a clogged pipe. I'm not a plumber, clearly. A clogged pipe, and there was like water coming up the floor drain. Now, luckily, it wasn't like uncontrollable, but it was coming up, and it's like, okay, well, we can't use the bathroom now, so we got a problem. Fair enough. Like, at least we can stop using the bathroom and it stops. So I was like, all right. So I called, and I'm not going to say the, the name of the company, but I will never forget this, and I now don't trust them, and I was going to go with them, like, for a, for a future plumbing thing. And I now just don't trust them. This was years ago now, too. I called them. They're like, are you currently our customer? I said, no, but you guys have 24-7 support. I need help. There's, there's water all over the damn place. Like, this is like sewage. Like, this isn't good. They're like, well, I think it was a Friday. So they're like, we can come. Uh, let me let me check the system or something. So they go like, you hear them typing. And then it's like, oh, we can come on. And I'm I'm skewing some details. That's why I'm hesitating. 
so it, so that you can't identify the company. They're like, we can come on Monday. And I was like, you can come on Monday for 24-7 customer support. And they're like, well, let me just check if there's an earlier appointment. I was like, I just told you this is an emergency. And now you're telling me that there may be an earlier appointment and you just went to the most convenient one. They're like, well, we can come tomorrow. And I was like, all right, we're done here. And I hung up. You can't yep. like, oh my, like it was like, it was like a panic. Like people were panicking. Like I, I called them like, we have a serious problem. Like clearly this is a plumbing place. Like they know this happens. We have a serious problem. We got a fucking leak or like in this case, we got a backup. Like, you know, this is unhealthy. Like this, we shouldn't have this. Like we've stopped it. We've like kept the problem, but we need help because like we can't use the bathroom all, all night, whatever. Like this is a serious problem. We need help, you know? And then they're just like, oh, well, it would be convenient for us to come in like three to four days. No, I didn't ask you for convenience. I didn't ask you about any of that. It's a 24-7 call line. I didn't I didn't call for a chat. I would, if, I, if I could have waited, <laughs> I would have called tomorrow. This is a problem. I need help now. And if you're booked, that's fine. Like, come on, man. They had an earlier appointment. All yeah, right. I don't. Come I, on, I, I, dude. I hate that. Yeah. Frick. That's. That's a pet peeve of mine. I don't know if that's like a thing that everyone experiences, but I definitely would be pissed off in that kind of situation too. I, like I you, hung you've up, clearly like, labeled it. you've clearly labeled it as an emergency. You're calling the emergency helpline, and I'm I'm and like, you're exasperated. That water is it's like we've been, out. we've been like, yeah, we, there's water all over the place. We just had to clean it up. We contained it. I'm literally actually covered in shit, like literally covered in shit. <laughs> it's disgusting. Like we need help. Okay. Like yeah. I need help. I've explained this. Well, like, come in four days. Oh, four days, is it? All right, no problem. We'll get the shovel out, and I'll just do this for the next four days, scooping the water out. <laughs> like, come on! Oh, Frick. man, yeah. Luckily, all it's right, all fixed was... now. Not by them. That was a good tangent. Jesus all right, let's Murphy. get back to it. Uh, next next tip here, tip number four. Stay active with your to-do list and task, man- task management software. So I've been kind of hesitant on this one. Um and I've been off and on on it, but I've I've noticed that there's a couple benefits. So when I fill out my to-do lists, when I make sure that my Jira tasks are properly documented, uh, it looks better on me as a person, as a worker, because people can re- reference what I've been doing, uh, especially – and this is why I say from it's a tip for working from home. It's especially important for people that are working from home because – Come evaluation time, come like any complaints on you or something like that. You've got to have some evidence that you've been doing something. And these task management softwares, especially the ones that are linked to your company's, you know, ticketing system or whatever, however, whatever, however you use to manage your projects uh, will come into play. It's just the, the reality of it. And sometimes they can be a hindrance. Which is the which is the balance, and this is the, why like I go back and forth on it because if you have to fill out every single little task that you do uh, in this task management software, it can actually delay you more than it can help you. So that's why I kind of I do overarching tasks. So I don't in the task management software for work, uh, I will do like a task like I'm making the user management system. But I won't go and I won't break it down too much or be like, okay, I'm doing the login, I'm doing the logout, I'm doing the user editing permissions, I'm doing whatever. Like I won't go through and I won't uh, mark out each and every task. But as I'm doing that task, I'll type in some comments inside that overarching task. So I'll type out like, you know, finished uh, finished logout or something like that, uh, you know, finished login, had some issues with whatever, like I'll, I'll, I'll document my process as I'm going through it, but not in so, too much detail. What I've been doing recently as well on top of that is I have my own task management software that I'm using, Todoist, and that's where I'll kind of break up my smaller tasks, make sure that my, you know, my days are uh, combined because I do it in really like, you know, casual language. I don't, I don't focus on the the language of it. I just make sure that whatever I type, I understand myself and I don't care if anyone else understands it. But what it also gives me is a way again in that evaluation time to pull up all those tasks and be able to talk about it. Or in just when you're talking about a project with uh, your manager or or whatever, you can pull up both your, you know, your uh, formal task management software where you've like, you know, put effort into your tasks, put effort into your language and your informal one and be able to talk through it together. Um, so I find, again, the to-do list is for like really quick task management. And the other thing that I do is I manage my meeting notes in there as well. 
And it allows me to kind of have more structured meetings and have more effective meetings. So that's another thing like having structured meetings is a really big deal with uh, remote working because when you have meetings that go off on tangents, kind of like we, what we do, like Matt and I just had, I mean, we're just having a casual conversation in a podcast, which we can do, but in a very structured work meeting, you don't want to go off on too many tangents. If you have those notes in front of you, like what you want to talk about during the meeting, what you need to demo and stuff like that, uh, it'll make the meeting go by a lot faster, I've noticed. Whereas if you're kind of like just doing it off the cuff, you'll be talking with a bunch of ums and you'll be like, oh yeah, this, and then jumping around. I, I, I've done that many times and it's just been kind of a, kind of a pain for the people listening and for myself because sometimes I'll forget to mention something and then I'll have to go out and reach out to people again and bother them and stuff like that. And I've had it happen to me. So kind of a two-in-one uh, thing there. Make sure that you are using your task management software effectively uh, again, that's not overusing it. That's the, that's another, like, again, it's important to not be like, I'm logging everything I do in this thing. Like every minute of my day is going to be logged in this task management software because now you're wasting the company's time or you're wasting your own time. Uh, you have to, you have to find that balance and it will take some trial and error and it will take you probably giving up on it a couple of times, but make sure that you try and figure out a way to kind of use it effectively for both yourself, your, your team, um, and for future reference purposes. Uh, I'm a little weird on the uh, the old task software myself. Um, I get like into these moods where I'm super into it and I do it. Um, the reason why I'm hesitating so much is because I'm kind of off the rails on it again. I don't... I'm, I'm like, I'm that lunatic in the office that didn't use conversation view and email until like eventually it got me in trouble. Like I was just like, no, I'll just get them in order and I'll just remember... And, uh, I did for like years and then all of a sudden I just, like, I think the, maybe the email program, um, defaults were always the conversation view. And that's how, that's what converted me. Like, it, I don't know if it was me, I can't remember, but I guess I just think that I try to rely on software and then it, what, what usually, what usually makes something like a productivity tool shine for me is on a regular day, anything can work, right? Anything can work. But it's what works, what you need, what you used, and how you got out of a stressful, hectic, or problematic situation or problematic day. If my task software gets in the way on a day in which something went down and I def desperately need to fix it and people are freaking out and it gets in the way, that task software is out. I've always said that the best way to get me to uninstall your app is to send me a notification when I'm pissed off because I'm just going to be like, oh, I use this app every day. You want me to buy your product, do you? And hold, uninstall, yes. And then it's gone. And there's a 50-50 chance or less of me reinstalling that app. I've done that for games. I've done that for so many things where I just say, all right, you're kicked to the curb. Get out of here. You've annoyed me. I was busy. That's it. You're out of here. So for me... I think my my baseline and the thing that I have actually stuck to finally is, and I think I mentioned this, is I write down what I'm going to be worried about before I go to sleep. And so I only use my task software if it's something that needs to be done at a specific time and I'm going to be worried about it. So as a general thing, if you're going to be worried about it, write it down, put the put the reminders, the notifications, the alarms, whatever you need for that thing. If you're not going to be worried about it, then I leave it personally. Now I, that's my balance. That doesn't, that's certainly not Mike's balance and it probably isn't you, the listener's balance balance either. But that's what I've found is uh, if I'm going to be worried about it, I'm just going to write it down, put it in, put it in an appointment, put it in a to do, put it in a, an alarm, a Google reminder, something. But if I'm going to be worried about it, offload it. If I don't, if, if it's not a big deal and I, and I know I'm going to see it in my email, then I just don't, I just don't care and I don't bother. Yeah. I think the, the thing is, is like that balance is really hard to find. And I think the main thing that you want to do is experiment with different strategies. So don't lock yourself into something that you hate. Um, try to find a balance between something that you hate and something that is helpful. That's the, that's the main thing that I want you to get out of this. Uh, it's really hard. It's, I would say not using it is probably not a good way to go about it. Like not, not, you know, controlling your tasks at all and just going off the cuff for the entire day or the entire week. 
that's probably not going to be great unless you have a really good memory and a really good, you know, internal system uh, for everything. Uh, for the regular person, use it for the stuff that you need to use it for. Like Matt said, he needs it for those things that are going to worry him. And when he writes those down, they worry him less because they're written down and he can go through them. Like he can look at that and try to work it out and pace it out. I think that's a really good way of approaching it. Um, obviously, some people worry about more things. Some people worry about less things. But that, that's kind of how I approach it as well, actually. Uh, whereas like I don't do task for everything. Because, again, it sometimes gets in my way. But I do tasks for all my meetings because those are something that I am a little bit worried about that I do want to do quickly, that I do want to have more structure. That's that's why I use task management for meetings. I do task management when I get overwhelmed by all the different projects. As soon as I start getting overwhelmed, I'm like, okay, I'm opening up my task management software and I'm writing down what I'm getting overwhelmed with and it helps. So that's when I kind of use it the most. And that's why I'm hesitant on it recommending it because I don't have a very good system myself. Like I'm not perfect at it. Um, whereas like I, it, I, I it's completely out be. of my way. I don't think you can. I don't be. know. Yeah. That's the thing. Like I'm, I always try new things. I'm always trying to perfect it and I always change it up, but it, it, it overall, it helps. It, it helps more than it uh, hinders, which is I think the goal. I, I, w- I will say one thing is that people I, I find will, and, and again, everyone's different, but in my opinion, people, um, try to structure their lives and a big part of this is is a to-do app oftentimes they try to structure their lives a bit too much and i understand that some people need or want structure some people need or want discipline and some people will see see my crazy working hours all over the place as not me not being disciplined but i am disciplined in that i finish my work tasks you know i deliver them according to the deadlines i try to Make it a, you know, if I'm designing a software or something, I'm, I make it a good UX. I'm making sure that if I'm working with somebody, they're not overworked and, and stuff like that. So I'm disciplined in that regard, but I'm just sort of, I'm sort of like scatterbrained with a disciplined deadline like piece. And one of the biggest things that, that annoys me, and this is to, to bring it all back, is there's people out there and, and you might be one of them, like the listener is they'll be like, well, okay, let, let's hypothetically say, there's something happening on Thursday. I don't know. Something's happening on Thursday. Some some made up thing. And I say, hey, you know, we, we should go do this on, on Thursday. And I hate the response of, I can't. Thursday's laundry day. You're that structured that you can't just do laundry when you need clothes? Like, do you really need clothes that day? Can you just do it? Can you throw a load in and then leave? You know, uh, like, and some people are like, no, I, like my task manager says, and it, I'm like, you know, when I, I know I'm disciplined enough to do my laundry because I look at the floor or the, like the, cause I, I literally just have a pile of like clothes, like dirty clothes. And I just pick them up, toss them down in the washer and I'll be like, damn, like I need some, cl- <laughs> I need some clothes. And what it does is it allows me to not make laundry a chore. If that makes sense. I feel like if you're too structured, it's like, oh, great. Here comes laundry day again. You know, here we go. And then it's like, oh, better go get the old laundry basket out. And I feel like that's how people get annoyed or like bored. Or in my case, I, I kind of start getting depressed. I'm like, oh, I do laundry tomorrow. And I know that some people, like I said, will say that's like me not being disciplined. But like, if I need clothes, I'm not wearing terribly dirty clothes i'm just it's not a chore to me it's like oh i need clothes throw some in and that's it (laughs) you know it's like oh i needed this it'd be like it'd be like me thinking that a chore is going to get groceries it's like we go i go get groceries like on the same day same two days like pretty strictly now because i'm trying to like avoid going out too much just due to the whole covid thing but in reality it's sort of a more freeform thing where I still do like the weekly thing because that, that makes sense. But I'm also just going at any time. Just sort of like, oh, you know, on a Thursday or Friday, I'll pop out to the store in the afternoon sometime. I'm not saying like, well, at 2 p.m. I need to. And I just, I think that's maybe why I'm against using task managers too much. Because if you're, if you're doing something on a consistent basis over and over and over and over and over again, and it's something you don't enjoy specifically if it's something you do not enjoy because obviously if you're like a soccer player you can't just make up your own matches but like if you're you know if it's something you do not enjoy like i don't go like hell yeah we're doing some laundry but i also don't go like frick i gotta do laundry i just go like oh damn i got some dirty clothes here toss them in there you go done and it's not a chore to me 
it's not like, oh, here comes Thursday again. <laughs> you know, it's almost like I'm avoiding the... I'm avoiding domesticated life. I don't know if that's what you'd call it, but I'm avoiding that whole like monotony of being like, oh, it's laundry day. Yeah. No, I, I, I'm in kind of the same boat as you were. Like I, I do stuff. I have a structure to my week, but like, I don't have a specific day that I'm like, you know, I'm going to clean once a week, but it's not going to be like, you know, I clean on Saturdays or whatever, or I clean on Sundays. It'll be maybe on the weekend. Maybe it'll be Friday, maybe a Thursday. I don't know. So, but I will say that some people have the reverse reaction to you uh, about not having structure. Mm-hmm. So, like, some people are so dependent on structure that they will start panicking and, like, hate their life if they don't have that structure. Like, if they don't have the Thursday laundry day, they th- they'll start, you know, losing it a little bit and all that. So, it is really dependent on the person, I think. Um, but I think the the point is that – if you're not – if you hate that structure, then definitely try something else. Definitely stop structure. Like if you hate doing laundry every Thursday and, and you think about – like every day you think about the fact that you have to do laundry on Thursday and it's bothering you, then don't do laundry on Thursday. Like do it whenever. Like, you know, do what Matt was saying. Don't structure it. Just do it when you have dirty you clothes. Have to, just do it yeah. when you need it because you're just going to be like, damn, yeah. I got to do this. But again, like it depends on the type of type of person you are. Um, I think there are people that have to do it that day, whatever it is, and they feel better if they do it that day. So, you know, hats off to you, I guess, to the people that like it. Um, moving on here, though, let's uh, get to the next point, which is five. Tip number five, create a focused work environment. Uh, so this one, depending on where you're living or how, how like what your apartment's like or what your home is like can be a little bit difficult, but you can try. So the best, the biggest thing is try to make your area as secluded as possible uh, so that you can avoid distractions. Like if someone, you know, keep walking through your area or, uh, you know, goes up to your door and constantly opens it or whatever. Like if you're, you know, working in the <laughs> middle of the living room like I am. I think of like the, the scenario of me of like, if we were in an office, the very first thing that popped out of my head is like a cartoon me running over and being like, like just opening the door a little bit for you and then running back to my office just to piss you off. Like, oh, yep. it's Mike's like, I don't know, 3 p.m. call. Run over there, eh, little open door, and then just <laughs> run back to my office. Yep. But the reality is, is that uh, if you have kids, like we don't, Matt and I do not have kids. Uh, the reality is, though, if you do, that is a thing that you have to worry about. Like that's a constant, like they'll just open doors and then not close them. And they'll open doors for no reason sometimes just to look in or like, you know, to see what's up or whatever. Well, they're curious. Um, they so, don't know anything. Like they're learning yeah, everything, you know. Exactly. They're learning everything. But you have to set some boundaries with that as much as you can uh, to actually get your work done. Because if you keep getting distracted, if you have a bunch of distractions around you constantly happening all the time, uh, it will hinder your work day. So if you're coming from an office structure where you have your own office or you have your own cubicle and no one goes around you and distracts you and you go to home and you're working in the middle of the living room and you have kids everywhere, that can be a big hindrance. So try to figure out a way to you know sec- make your area secluded so that you can get the work done so that you can get back to you know you know being with your family or whatever. Because the the more distractions, the more you're going to have to work and stuff like that. Uh, the other thing that you can do to help is to like because usually when you're working at home you're working on your personal computer a lot of the time now you're not provided a computer for your work um, but if you are if you aren't provided a computer for your work you can kind of separate out accounts so you can create a separate account for work so that you're not distracted by your social media stuff so that you're not you're not distracted by Reddit YouTube and all that uh, make that account kind of only for work um, this is one of the things that I don't practice what I preach. Like I have suggested this to people that have trouble with uh, going to too many things, but I don't do that. And the main thing for me is like, I can't get away from my passwords that I have in my regular account on Chrome because I I just, I hate entering passwords. It's one of my, like one of my big pet peeves. So the only way I guess to do that (laughs) would be like to, (laughs) yeah, it's a weird pet peeve, but I hate doing it. Uh, I like, I like the autofill and I've gotten so used to it and accustomed to it that I just like, that's my biggest thing for switching uh, 
browsers, although browsers now can import yeah, passwords. So you can import export that file, right? Yeah, you can exactly. You can e- easily import export it. And I could even do that between accounts, which is something I might do because I have noticed I do sometimes get distracted by stupid like Instagram, Twitter, and stuff like that. So it might be something that I, I take my own word for, but I definitely recommend trying to do that if you're trying to get some like deep work done because you don't, you don't want to get distracted for no reason. Uh, do you know? Do you know what actually helps mm-hmm. me with that? And I mentioned this a million times that I put shows on, that I that like you know whatever, uh, like shows on that aren't distracting. Even if they're new to me, I'll just have like a show on in the background. But um, one of, if I want to get deep work done and I'm finding myself bouncing, like I'm like I can't settle myself, I put on a show that's boring or that I've seen a million times, and then I'm and then I'm literally not distracted, but I still feel like I'm not doing work, and then I just start doing a bunch of work. But it has to be like specifically boring. Like, damn! Like, I don't want to watch this. Yeah, i I have done stuff like that before. Um, sometimes, what I'll do is I'll actually turn off the show for like ten minutes, and then I'll work. And then if I want it back on, I'll turn it back on. But most of the time, what happens is like I'll just not turn it back on until I'm done a specific amount of tasks. And then when I get to some sort of monotonous task, like you know, entering stuff into a database or copy pasting, I'll turn it back on. So that's I, I will for me pause too. the show. Like it'll be like a half hour yeah. show, and I'll pause like a hundred times. Like that, that wouldn't. Yeah. That's not even out of the realm, you know. Yeah, exactly. So like I, I do, I do, I have done that approach. Uh, both approaches where I just throw something really boring on that I've seen a million times, or I'll throw on like a, I'll throw on some music that doesn't have any words in it, stuff like that. Like anything that can get me into that deep work zone. But a lot of the time, I can just get myself in it now as long as I'm in my deep work hours. Like if I'm, you know, sitting down after eight a.m., it's all good. All good to go usually. Um, But with that, to get me in that zone, uh, the next tip here is routine is key. Uh, Routine helps me get in that work zone and get me less distracted. So what I do is I have a morning routine where I wake up, uh, go make myself a coffee. And that's like a five minute, six minute process now because I have a French press. And I was going to say, you're like, a French press person, aren't you? I'm a French press person now, which is taking like, it takes a, a while, but I like it because like I throw on a podcast, I listen to like the news for like 10 minutes while I'm making my coffee. Then I just sit down on my computer. Uh, then I'll open up my social medias really quick. I'll usually check my Twitter, check Instagram, whatever, check Reddit. And after about 15 minutes, I get bored of that. And then I open up my work, my to-do lists, uh, where I was left off and I'll just kind of read a little bit of the work that I have to do. I won't actually do anything for a little while, but, and then I'll start picking tasks that I want to do right now. Um, lately I've been picking harder tasks first. So before my advice was picking easy tasks just to get started, but I think I've shifted a little bit where I'll pick a harder task first and I'll give myself a little extra time to do it so that I, so that I'm not rushed before my meetings or anything like that. So if I, you know, worst case scenario, can't, uh, can't get onto the other tasks. At least I'll get the big task out of the way that day. And then I can kill off the other tasks after my meetings. Whereas before what was happening is I was doing a couple of short tasks and sometimes those short tasks would, uh, become more complicated as we know with any sort of situation, any sort of programming thing. You're like, Oh, this is easy. I'll just have to throw an array in here. And then all of a sudden it's like, Nope, these arrays are all, uh, you know, you have to split them and you have to slice them and then you have to clone them as well because all the references get thrown around. Anyway, like we, we all, we've all been there. We think a task is easy and it becomes hard. And then I'll get stuck on the easy tasks. And then on the back of my mind, I'll be like, Oh shit, I still have to do my hard task for today. I still have to do all these complicated things. And that'll kind of, that'll make me actually procrastinate even more. So I've taken to just doing the hard, hard task right away. If it takes me all afternoon, then it takes me all afternoon. That's not a big deal because it's the hard task. It's the most important one usually. Um, and then I'll do the easier ones later. That's worked for me. So that's kind of my routine right now. I don't have anything crazy other than that. Uh, but I have heard that other routines of like, you know, having a good afternoon, you know, set, set lunch and doing a bunch of stuff during lunch and then coming back to work can help you get more done after your peak hours. So I haven't experimented with that. I might do that. It seems to work for me though. If I have that set, you know, set couple things, it's not like something like, you know, you know, I have to prep for two hours to do something or anything like that. It's like a 10 minute thing, uh, like making your bed or something is part of it. And it helps, it helps me kind of start my day. Um, yeah, I'm much, much less structured than you for sure. Uh, 
I sort of like wake up, but I wake up at like a time in which I can like lay in bed for another hour and I just sort of like answer all my emails, check on my phone, shit, whatever, finish that. Um, and then I'll typically go make a coffee. And then while I'm doing that, usually a few, there's a few bounce backs. So people chatting back cause I've sent all the messages out, uh, emails and whatever. So then I deal with those while I just like watch a TV show, watch like usually one episode or something. And then I then go to the office area and start basically working from there. Um, sounds like a routine. Sounds like, I mean, yeah, but it's, it's one of those routines where it's natural. Like uh, today I forgot I had to do some stuff. And so I just like skipped all of that and just had to like run out to the, to like the local butcher. Mm. And so I'm fine without that. I think, I think this is all in the pursuit of me not being chored structured chored or like structured or like mm. me being like, today's the grocery day you know i just hate like i just i don't want that so uh i'm doing like a routine that i'm okay with like i'm it's like a natural routine uh and and it being upset or changed does kind of screw like i kind of don't know what time it is like i've just looked at the clock now but it doesn't feel like it's that time like it's 6 30 something here so it just doesn't feel like that time uh but yeah I don't know. I don't know what else to say. Like, it's just, it's the same thing. It's just me. It's me fighting, fighting the routine system, I guess. I don't know who I'm fighting. I'm fighting against myself, I suppose. And again, it's all about the flexibility and it's all about figuring out what works for you. Like, maybe you're a structured person and you need that routine. Like, I've heard my, my thing with recommending exact routines. Like, I just told you mine because that's mine and I wanted to give you an example. And you told us yours and that's great. But I, I don't want to go out there and recommend like, okay, wake up at 8 a.m. And like, you know, 10 minutes after that, do this. And then 10 minutes after that. I've seen that all the time. Like, doing research for this episode – most of the articles that I read, most of the videos that I read had a routine section to it. And they actually said like, do this routine. It's like, you know, get up at 8am. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't, don't eat breakfast, go to your desk, answer all your emails, then get up, go eat breakfast. Like, I don't think that's going to help many people personally. Like, I don't think telling people what to do is going to help them. Um, like, maybe it does get, for you. But... Like you'd get used to it though. Like it is, yeah. it is something where if we worked at a traditional office, you would just naturally have a routine because you need to do X thing before the office. You know, you need to have food or you need to have a, have a drink or you need to take your medicine or you need to wake up at a certain time so you can do your commute. And so you would naturally go into a routine and therefore their routine is sort of, it's almost like the workplace telling you that I think is where they're yeah. getting at it. And you would get used to it, but I'm fighting the monotony of it. You know what I hate yeah. actually is this is it's like okay this th- this might be weird maybe I maybe like somebody can analyze this if they're like a psychologist but I I think always think this I grew up to not be uh, I, I like we were all governed for the most part by our parents or by our guardians or whoever raised us whoever it was we were we like grew up under their governance like we were governed by them to an extent if you think about it and then we were like, we grew up to be like adults and we can go and do stuff. I don't want to be locked into an office without the ability to leave. I don't feel like an adult if I say like, well, I, my bank meeting's at noon. Hey, hey, boss, can I go at noon? No, you can't go at noon. Oh, okay. You know, I'm just back to being quote unquote governed by another by another party it's like what did i grow up for just so that somebody else could tell me what to do yep and so i mean that's that that was traditional work environment right there like you just nailed it it's still happening to a lot of people it's even happening to people that are working from home right it's now where they're getting people, this probably yeah uh, probably most people it's like so people get it like people work from home but then the company wants to monitor them at all times so they install the software that watches their webcam that like listens to their microphone that checks all their typing and stuff like that so now they're being monitored while they're at home which is in my opinion the worst and they have to do that and like if they have to go up and get up for the bathroom they probably have to press a button that's like going to the bathroom like it's that bad it's a some in some places right so i think that that is not good for productivity i think that that is the opposite of what you want in your work environment because again you're treating your your workers as children you're treating them as someone as people that you don't trust 
that in my opinion, when you put something on their computer like that, that's telling them, we don't trust you to do the job. Like you've worked with us for 60 years, you've done the job for six years, but we don't trust you even a day, even a second of the day to do your job. That's what they're telling. No matter what they say, like, oh, we're trying to, you know, save money and migrate our workers effectively and not lose any work out. No, that's bullshit. They don't trust you. <laughs> yeah, they think yeah. that you're an, like, you're a, but that, like, they actually, they don't think that you're a person. They just, you're just a number in their system and that's it. And they're trying to get a productivity thing out of you. Yeah. Exactly. Even though you've been there for X amount of years and you've done enough work for them to earn their trust, they don't trust you. In my opinion, that's the step where I would, I would start looking for a new job. I wouldn't quit. I would keep doing my job to the best of my ability, but I would 100% start looking for a new job that wouldn't do that to me. Now, now to be, to be fair to, to some roles out there, you need – like some roles are structured for a reason. You know, you can't have a hole in your firefighter coverage because everyone doesn't want to work from 9 to 10 a.m., for example. And so there are reasons why some sure. jobs are structured where it's like you're in the damn firehouse or however your, you know, however your country or city deals with their firemen. You know, it's like yeah. – <laughs> All these people that are in the, that are on the firefighting team better be, you know, like shift one better be there during shift one, or we're gonna have a serious problem. If something goes wrong. Also, I used to work in a factory, and obviously my spot on the line opens up at whatever time, and it ends at whatever time until I'm relieved by the next shift. So I need to be there. So you get the same. I got the same sort of sort of routine. I think that's where I learned my routine hate. Where I was like, man, frick, like, I gotta be here at 9 a.m. or whatever. And it's just like, I don't, like, what if I gotta go to the bank or something? It's always the bank. I don't know why it's always the bank in my head. But it's always like, what if I gotta do something? And it's like, no, you can't do that, you know? But then I learned in, and I'll let you, like, take over, but, and I learned, because I went and worked at BlackBerry for a while, that it wasn't like that anymore. It was sort of, like, I could go, you know, obviously, I'm not going to show up at one in the morning or anything, but it was like, you know, business as usual, nine to five. But I was able to, if it was like a really crazy day, and it's like, I used to not really eat lunch in the office, I would just go for a walk, and I would just like walk around the mall to stretch my legs. Totally fine. I could just go do that. There were times where it's like, hey, I got to leave early for X thing, be like, cool. And then sometimes I would just, you know, depending on... Like some meetings, like it's just like, just like what we're talking about. Like some meetings would be at 9 a.m. So I have to show up or I have to call in or whatever. Of course, there's some structure that has to be done. But what I, what I loved about that place was it was just like show up, but you know, do your work, of course. But in my particular roles, I was free enough that it was, it was like I had a, a friend in the hospital one time. So they let me go, like, you know, they let me leave early. I had to go to future shop to deal with something, some stupid warranty thing that was ending. I was able to do that at lunch hour and it, and, and it went a little over the lunch hour and no one's sitting there being like, Hey, you know, it's been three minutes past your lunch hour. And that's, I think that's where I started developing. Like I can actually be like free during the day and still be disciplined enough to get my work done. You know, I, like, Oh damn, that warranty thing took an extra half hour. I'll just stay an extra half hour or an hour to finish whatever task so I can give it to bill or whoever, you know? So I think, the difference between a factory job or like a call center where they do monitor a lot, uh, everything that you're doing is like those to be fair are shitty jobs. Like they're not great jobs in terms of pay in terms of, uh, in terms of just work environment, stuff like that. So it's a little bit more important to monitor your workers and to make sure that they're doing their jobs as bad as that is to say, like, I'm just trying to think of a good way to say I mean, it. Some people, some people probably like it. Like you and I actually had a discussion with somebody yes. who loved working in the call center because they got full benefits. They like just chilling. They like, they like talking to people, but you're correct in that. No, uh, very few people, I think grow up, like grow up dreaming of being a call center person. The actual, yeah. like the actual call center could be totally bearable and totally fine. And it could be great for some people, but in general, it isn't a job where like no one grew up and was like, I'm going to work on the line in an assembly. Line. You know, no one was like all for that. That is, it's not a, it's not a typical, it could be someone's, but it's not a typical dream job, if that makes sense. Hmm. It's usually an intermediary job. It's usually a job you have to do, unfortunately, because of circumstances, stuff like that. And it's understandable, like to not want to be fully productive during it like i would fully understand i would fully expect that as a manager like i would just you know 
this job kind of sucks. Uh, people don't want to do it. Or the environment's so, dirty because it has to be, or it's too hot. You know, yeah, like, like there's, there's ridiculously hot or whatever. Shitty jobs that I hope in the future will be taken over by robocallers so people can do good jobs. Or like can be taken, not, not, okay, call center is a bad one because I don't want that job to exist in, in the first place. Like that should be just gone. But some stuff like a factory, uh, I'm I hoping. Mean, some people might like, ah, uh, call centers? Call center, no. Because like, do you really, terrible. do you really want to talk to a robot though? No, I don't want to talk to anyone. I don't want to talk to, that's what I'm saying. I don't 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 want 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 anyone to call me about anything. (laughs) You know what? Period. I'd say probably chat is the best invention. Because you have the option, like I've had it before, where they're like, call this extension to like, give me your credit card number uh, to like, you know, process this. But the chat is, I would would always go for tech support chat. And it's probably less stressful on the person. Because even though they're sort of, even though they're more than likely monitored, uh, for how long it takes to do their tickets and stuff like that, it's probably less stressful because they're just texting, and so they actually do have like twenty or thirty seconds to think. And the, no, I don't think anyone's going to be like, "Hey, your words per minute's down because you were thinking." You know, yeah. I'm way more forgiving on the te- on the chat. I'm way more like lenient on time because I'm usually doing something else during it. Like it allows me to multitask. So, yeah, call center is a bad one. Let's say factory. In my opinion, factories are going more automated, more automated, less people have to do the shitty jobs. Yes, absolutely. There's some jobs in a factory that absolutely will still need, will, will still be needed. Mechanic. Uh, but usually they're not the shittiest jobs. Like, you know, they're maintaining equipment, stuff like that. Like you're not sitting in one spot and putting a thing onto a lawn. Like maintenance and engineering like, is, is... Maintenance is, and engineering will still be needed. Although the thing is, is like... It's like you want to get rid of those jobs, but then some people can only do those jobs and then it's a whole like... You know what I mean? It's a whole it's a whole political discussion. Well, I, agree, I don't know but if it's like, political. It's more so workspace. It, it but is workplace. Yeah, but. It's workplace. But in my opinion, that's where it's going. Regardless of whatever people think, like jobs are gonna like there's gonna be less jobs in the future, less shitty jobs more more than anything. Like so, delivery jobs that's gonna go away. Factory jobs that's gonna go away. Stuff like or that. Less the than- shittier jobs are mostly going away. Does this disregard those for now? Like what I'm talking about is more web development stuff. If you're hiring a web developer and okay, in the first little bit, you don't trust him, whatever, like you want to see how he does. Maybe there's some reasoning behind like tracking their hours and stuff in the first six months to a year of work, whatever with the developer. But after you've, after they've earned your trust and they can do the job and they're continually doing the job, in my opinion, there's no reason to start tracking them to any degree. So as long as they're there during the work hours that you have determined that you need them to be um, in a reasonable effect. Like, so like you were saying the nine to five for Blackberry, when you were working there, uh, you had flexibility. And I think that that's a really good structure. Oh yeah. Like, you know, a set, a set working hour structure, if you need it, most companies need it with the flexibility of people kind of, you know, going around it a little bit and being clear about it, like, you know, when you don't show up till 11 a.m., you're usually texting your boss saying, like, hey, I'm not going to show up till 11 for whatever reason. Or, or like, in, in a tech position, sometimes somebody will, someone will tackle something, uh, like, at 9 a.m. from home uh, or even, like, a little before. Let's say they just check their email and they tackle something and then it kind of spirals out of control. It just doesn't make sense for that person to break work and, like, break their work process and, you know, commute to work at that point. Sometimes it's like, oh, I'll be in at noon because I've been dealing with X. You know, obviously that, exactly. you know, there's no point to being like, hey, you weren't in this, you were in your chair, not mine, you know. Mm-hmm. And that's that's what I think people should be treated like. So people should be treated like grownups. People should be treated that they they do know what they're doing. And hopefully you'll have the the right employees that can take that kind of environment and thrive in it. Now, it's not going to go for everyone. Some people really need that structure, even in web development, even in software development, whatever. They need that structure. And there's companies that provide that structure. So I think it kind of bounces out. For me personally, I'm not going to thrive in that structure. So I don't – I that's why I don't propagate it. That's why I, I, I recommend against it, right? That's why I think it's not a good thing. But I'm sure there's people out there that thrive under super structured elements, even in web development and uh, so, some and people like maybe aren't like as self disciplined, yeah. And so they're they're like, well, I'm going to get in trouble at 8 a.m. if I'm not on the line or whatever. And so at that point, I need to be there. Or if you're uh, working in like a 
um, like an operations center uh, or like a, a call center. I don't know why I call it operations center. If you're working at a call center, you know, needs to be somebody there. <laughs> literally, literally needs to be some, someone there using the phones. You can't just be like, well, our 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. folk just didn't feel like <laughs> showing up. So, you know, you can't have that. Exactly. And like when you're when I'm hiring someone or when I would be hiring someone, that's probably, especially if it's a junior developer, that's probably the most important thing for me is that they are a self-learner. They're able to manage their own schedule. They're able to do their work. Uh, obviously, with some super, they're junior developers, so they do need to be supervised. They do need to have some working sessions, stuff like well, they're that. they're effectively in but training. In training, yeah. That's, that's how you have to treat it. They're in training, but they are able to maintain their own hours, essentially. I don't have to go in there and track their hours. So if like, for instance, if I had a junior developer that was working on a project and every time I reach out to them, they don't have any progress or don't have anything to say about that project. Uh, and then all of a sudden I have to be like constantly reaching out to them. And then, and I mean, as soon as you start constantly reaching out to them, they'll start working on it. And that's the only way they're going to work on it. Even if they do a great job on that project, I don't, I don't see the relationship working. If I have to constantly be over top of you and trying to manage every little movement, even if you do a really good job in that kind of environment, it's not going to work out between myself and you. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Again, that that would be that would be my exit interview with them. I'd be like, okay, like we did this. You do a really good job in this kind of environment. Maybe next time go look for like a more structured work environment. Uh, I can write you a good recommendation, all that. That's how I would go about it. But if there's someone that, you know, on their own can get X amount of progress done and then they have, they hit a wall, usually they hit a wall. And that's when like they either reach out to me or I reach out to them and they talk about it. And every time there's that, that kind of progress, that's a good relationship. That's something that I can work with regardless of how good you are, or whatever, like you can see that the, there is, that you're, you're moving in the right direction. You're, you're using your time wisely, stuff like that, regardless of how many hours you work. It's just, you want to see that progress. So that's, I don't know why we got on that tangent because we were on routine is key, but I think that's an important one to talk about regardless. Uh, so I'm going to move on to the next tip here. Uh, tip number seven is keep communication channels open during work hours. So again, this is one of those structured things that Matt's probably not going to be very happy with, but if you're working in a larger team, and again, you have like five people on your team, 10 people on your team, 20 people on your team, and you're reliant on each other for doing tasks, and one of you, let's say that you're, you're nine to five, and one of you does not respond to messages until like, you know, the next day, or, you know, seven hours from that time, and they're delaying team member A, B, and C, that that's not going to work. So... The way that offices handle it is like you're literally in the office and you can go up to their desk and ask them directly. Yeah. Uh, if if you get to the point where they're not answering your emails or something like that, that's how offices do it. So you, when you go to a remote working environment, you want to have that option available for people to reach out to you. Now, you don't want to have that option abused where you're reaching out all the time. What How I kind of handle it is if I'm in a deep working session – and someone reaches out to me, I'll ping them back and be like, hey, I'm just fig fig figuring something out. Is this an emergency? And usually they'll say, no, I can reach out to you later and whatever. And then we can schedule a time after in my regular meeting time. If it's an emergency, though, at least I can go in there and check if it's a and actually get them moving on the whatever they were blocked on. That's what that allows me to do. So that's kind of the expectation I would have in a larger team. In a smaller team, like with Matt and myself, uh, we don't have that expectation all the time. Like a lot of times he'll reach out to me and I won't respond for a little while or I'll, I'll reach out to him and he won't respond for a little while because we have different working strategies, different working hours. And that's 99% of the time it's perfectly fine, uh, especially if you're in a smaller team. If you're a freelancer working on your own, it's not as important to have communication channels open during work hours, uh, in my opinion. But again, it all depends on your environment. Uh Again, it, team environments, I think it you do need to have that open because there's a lot of times where you do need to get reached out. You do need to reach out to someone and get a quick response to be able to continue a task. Although I will That's say, like, I, I agree. Okay, so you said, like, I would probably disagree with this point, and I agree and disagree. What it is is, generally speaking, I know what I'm the gatekeeper of. I know that X person needs to call me when they're done this so that they, they can get this information from me so that they can go do this next task. And so what I will do is I will specifically check 
my phone or specifically check my computer in the appropriate chat app where that person is going to reach out for me, email, whatever it is. And I will look for that person's emails and I will prioritize in my own head that person. So if it's you and like we're working on something specific and I'm going to be like, okay, if I see Mike's message, even if it's a 4 a.m., I'll answer it. And obviously I'm not going to be, even if, you know, I'm not going to do that every time. And it does depend on the urgency of the task. And so there's a lot of question marks there. But I am a proponent of, I will prioritize that. Like, I know for sure it'll be like, we're in the middle of this project and we're about to launch. A hundred percent, this person, if there's a problem, is going to message me. There shouldn't be any problems, but this person will. So I'll prioritize that person's messages for the next 24 hours in my own head. And if the launch goes okay, then it's like, all right, anything they have to say at this point is probably not that critical or is probably just feedback or chat. And so, you know, the project's launched, it's up, it's down, or it's up, it's, it's, already done in our system i don't know why i kept saying down in our system it is already up and already like done checked off so therefore okay you know the launch is complete i don't care now um now i am also a proponent of clients and i have told them this you know if you have ideas and stuff like this just rip them to me in rapid succession on email because we have a couple clients that will do that because they'll forget what their idea was by the time that you know, they'd be like, Hey, I have an idea. And then I'll answer them. Cause obviously like you having an idea, isn't a huge critical thing. So I'll answer you in a few hours and then they forget. So I'm like, just rip, you know, fire those off to me. Cause I'm not going to like worry about that. Some people get worried about their inbox number. I don't care. I'm just looking at my last day and being like, Oh, you know, Jim messaged me. Oh, you know, this person messaged me. Oh, you know, this, you know, this other person messaged me. And so I can prioritize what they said. Like, oh, these are just ideas. I'll answer them in three days. Or like sometimes people will be like, hey, the performance of my Google or on my Google like uh, page rank or page speed or I wish I the name of the damn thing, but it's like that speed thing where I like, you know, you check your rating out of a hundred. They'll be like, hey, can I make this better? I now know, all right, project's up. It's working. Could be improved. That goes for next week. <laughs> like I just naturally go, don't care about this till next week. Naturally move it out. And so comms always open agree with even outside of work hours agree with checking them and answering variable is it is it important did we just do a major launch and is like did mike and i just do a major launch and if there's a problem is mike gonna message me 100 percent. okay mike gets priority of 24 hours if he doesn't message me then doesn't message you in 24 hours then i assume the project is good and he kind of like goes back into like okay don't care now or not not don't care but it's more like Oh, I have a message from Mike. I'll check it in five minutes or something like that. Right. That's, that's kind of how it works. And that's how I handle things with clients as well. Yeah. Yeah. And like the, you made some good points about keeping comms open after work hours. Uh, whereas like, yeah, they're open, but you might not answer and you're probably not going to answer. Uh, and that's how I kind of treat it too. Uh, you can absolutely message me on Skype. You can message me on email outside of work hours, but the chances of me answering are pretty low. I do sometimes if I'm bored or if it's, if it is a particularly, you know, complex topic, I will fire off a response. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's very few and far between. And I made the expectation already during the course of uh, my working relationships with people that I usually don't. So they don't expect it. Um, it's just a nice surprise for them, or maybe it's not even a nice surprise. It's just like, whatever. Okay. They answer me. I'll get to it next week or tomorrow. It's just for me, one less thing to do the next day. One less thing to worry about. That's when I usually do it. When I, when I like, okay, I'll, I'll, you know, it'll be on my mind if I don't answer it again, this is something that happens pretty rarely for me. If it happened on a consistent basis where some people were messaging me and then expecting a response, that would be where I would actually have a communication with them being like, Hey, listen, I know you're emailing me at this time and you expect a response, but I only work during these hours. And that's when you have to set kind of hard boundaries. But luckily I haven't had to do that. All of my communication has been pretty like, you know, if people message me in the evening and I don't respond, they don't care. That, that, that's exactly it is like, I always treat a text message like it is a phone call is something that needs to be done right now or needs or has intricacy and needs to be done right now. The text message or the email is something that is supposed to be answered when available and then the instant message is, is sort of, I guess like text message falls in that like, like the text message is the most variable one where sometimes it is urgent ish, but it's like urgent ish within the next hour. So I don't need to call you. Yep. Exactly. 
Uh, okay, having said that, let's move on to tip number eight, almost done here, get the right tools. So again, you're coming from an office environment, or maybe you've been working from home for a little while. Um, and you just have like, a laptop, that's like 13 inches. And that's all you've been working on just on a desk or something. I think to get your productivity to a better place, you need to start experimenting with different tools and different in different things. So one one big thing is obviously your computer. If you had a work computer that you had to leave at work and now you have a home, you're using your home computer, um, you should try to reach out to your work to try to arrange either for pickup of their of the work computer if it's, if it's better or for maybe some sort of stipend from them to get you something better uh, to work on. Because if you're working on an old like Dell Inspiron or something like that at home, it's going to affect your productivity and the company should know that and should try to help you with that. Now, if you're a freelancer or just like, you know, starting up web development, it's again, another thing where like you're investing in yourself. Sometimes it is better to spend a little bit more on a computer. Uh, I had a, I had a discussion recently on a computer for, about computers where someone's like, well, I like my computer shit the bed. I need a computer right now. Um, I'm looking in the 300 to $400 range. And I'm like, this is going to be something you use for home and work don't you want to go a little bit more than that? Like to make sure that you have less problems to be able to use it for like five to 10 years. Like what's stopping you from going to the $600 range or the $800 range? And they're like, well, that's just how much I want to spend. And that's it. And in that case, like when someone asks me for advice on a computer, that's that cheap. I actually don't give them any, I actually don't give them any recommendations. I'll just say like, listen, it's a little bit out of the budget that I would recommend. Uh, there are some in there that you can find, but I can't really like wholeheartedly give you a, give you a recommendation on that cheap of a computer. So I always recommend to go a little bit more than what your budget, what you think in your head, because it seems like everyone wants the cheapest thing at all times, even when it's a work device, even when it's something that, you know, it's generating you money and you're a contractor. In my opinion, you should try to spend a little bit more. Like if you're a web developer, it's not out of the realm to be spending, you know, a thousand to $1,500 on a, on a computer. That shouldn't yeah, shock you, I agree with in you, my 100%. opinion. Yeah, it shouldn't shock you that that's how much you want to spend. Because as soon as you start getting into stuff like compiling, like, uh, you know, Vue.js, you start getting into stuff with uh, backend and uh, having Docker installed on your computer for de deployments, having a complicated IDE like VS Code with a bunch of plugins, you start running into RAM limitations, you start running into processing limitations, you start running into storage limitations. Like, if you go too cheap, yes, Absolutely, like you can still do it. Like, you know, a $300, $400 computer can still do web development, but at what cost to you? You're going to be troubleshooting more often. You're going to have a bunch of bloatware on there that's going to be reporting a bunch of stuff that you're doing all the time. So your internet's going to be getting hit. You're going to have issues with the screen. So you won't be able to work in different environments. Like $300 computers, those screens are crap. Like 99% of the time, they're going to be terrible. So if you're in an environment that's even dimly lit by the sun, you're not going to be able to see your computer. Like you're not going to be able to see your what, what you're coding. So you're going to have to go into like your bathroom and turn off the lights and then work in there. <laughs> you like, have to go just, into the bathroom, yeah. turn well, off like, the lights and then work from there. They're just that bad. Like the, the, things that, the things that computers skimp on as soon as they start going below a certain budget are like the screen, the obviously all the internals, like the processing power, the cooling and like just old hardware. They start throwing old, old stuff in there that could break at any moment or stuff like that. Like, it's just literally like the, the guideline you're, you're saying is the same one. I always say to people is how much are you like, I always ask like, how much are you using it? What are you using it for? How often are you doing that? And if it's going to be a, if it's going to be a pain in the ass for you every single day, like is, is it worth it? I always ask that question. Is it worth you constantly tinkering with it, screwing around with it, messing around in this case with the brightness? screwing around with it uh having trouble if you bought like cheap headphones you need headphones but they're, they're, they're cheap and so they like it has a microphone built in and they and it buzzes and it clicks and it has problems and how much is that worth to you are you willing to like, constantly deal with it and then i always say to them you're gonna have a bunch of problems and i can't help you with it you know don't keep coming to me every single day being like this clicks yeah it's a piece of crap like you bought the worst headset it's gonna click tick bang break crack it's gonna you know whatever but what I always tell people is choose the things that you're willing to cheap out on. Like I have a, like this is a desk from Zellers, you know, but it it's serviceable. It's fine. It's particle board. And my keyboard rack is currently on the fritz and I have to fix it for the hundredth time. But like, that's fine for me, but I have a, you know, a good keyboard. It's older, but like, it is good. It's fine. It's good. I have a 
Com- I have a couple computers here. I got my laptop here. I got my desktop here. I have two good monitors. So those are the things I spent money on. And my second monitor is like a is like a is like an older one, but it is it is used for secondary purpose. So I can in the future if I need to replace this, I can just get a cheap secondary monitor or just get a used one or something. And so choose the things you're willing to cheap out on. Like I'm sitting in this chair all day. So I buy a good chair, right? You need a good chair. And so I had one chair lasted almost 10 years. That thing went literally the, the, to the way of it literally disintegrated. So now I'm at another, another good chair, but and, and like, be smart about it, right? People think people are all, that are always trying to cheap out on stuff. You have to almost convince them. It's like, I understand if you don't have the budget, you don't have the budget. Fair enough. You know, whatever. Yeah. And then you have to work around the budget. But if, if it's just a matter of you being like, well, I, you know, I could spend a grand, but I only want to spend 400. You got to ask yourself like, okay, is it going to be a major problem for you? Are you using your computer once a week? Using it once a week, then who cares? Using it every day. And now it's like, hmm, like this is a problem. Like this is really annoying. Um, if you're going to be struggling, like annoyed, ticked off at it all the time. Like, is it really, is that worth your time? Like ser- serious question, like serious question. We, I replaced my LG G4. Technically speaking, I could have continued using it. I could probably continue using it until like the thing literally stops working. But I got annoyed at the fact that the damn thing was, was, was slow as hell. And every single time I wanted to click on something, again, it was that stressful situation. Normally it's fine for me to click on the send message button and take friggin' 10 minutes for the message app to open. But in a stressful situation where I need to get a response out quick, it's unacceptable to me that the CPU is throttling itself because of the heat, because it's that whole generation of phones had a heat problem, regardless of which. It worked, like it's serviceable, it thermal throttled itself, but it makes it slow. And so now I'm in a stressful situation, the, the, the phone's heating up because maybe it's hot outside or something, or maybe I was just playing a game, trying to send off a quick message and the app is glitching, it's not opening, and I'm like tra- panicking trying to open it. It's just not worth it. So I just get a nice phone. Like, you know what I mean? That, that, that's the baseline there. There's 4K cameras out there for webcam, but I'm just using a 1080p one. I don't have nice studio lighting because I just don't care. I have an old couch because I just don't care. And what I try to do by saying that stuff, and I've said this a bunch of times on the show, is, okay, I've saved a bunch of money on a couch now. So this couch breaks right now. If it's broken right now, and I get sit in it, it's just going, and it just breaks completely. I've got my money's worth out of that, and I can go buy a half-decent one again. And it saved me money where now I can, now I, now I have this lap, like I have this like nice, nicer and new laptop. I have a nice mouse. I have a few of them, you know, for my laptop and for my desktop. I have a good screen. I have a couple of screens. So if this secondary screen goes, so like what I'm saying is, is you choose what you want to cheap out on, why you want to cheap out on it that way. Okay. And you use it, you use your resources, the cheap ones and the other ones and the other ones. And the the cheap ones and the ones you want to pay a lot of money for, like your computer and stuff, you use them until they can't be used anymore reasonably. This couch is old, it creaks, but it works. I sit on it and it's fine. Over. But my chair was literally disintegrating. It was actually dissolving under my, under my like, butt. So I had to go. <laughs> it had to go. So that's it. And I, I, my car is 17 years old. And I'm doing a major repair in it to make it last for two more years. But, yep. but I'm using that resource. Like, this is, like, serious. I'm using that resource until it cannot be used anymore reasonably. And I'm, and I'm doing that with professional help. I'm not a mechanic. So, like, I'm getting help and he's, you know, I'm being, being advised and consulted on what I can do and what I should do and what I should buy in the future and all the rest of it. But that's the point is, like, you, you, you have to attack it sounds like it's a tangent, but it's not. It's if people come to you and they say like, oh, I want to, I want really good sound, but I want like really cheap. It's like, well, like, like how, like, why are you calling me? You know, like, yeah. I don't know, man. Like go buy the galaxy buds. We'll lose your $180. Well, you're going to use them every day for all day. I got like five sets of wireless headphones. I might buy the red galaxy buds just because they're freaking red, but I'm also going to use the crap out of them. They're convenient. I have a Samsung phone. They're easy to use. Bang. Easy enough. Now I have multiple Bluetooth headphones and I can have one for my iPad, you know, but I'm going to use them and I'm going to use them until they cannot be used any longer to maximize the money out of it. But yeah, strategically speaking, I'm not buying $10,000 headphones because I'm not an audiophile. So like I'm buying in my, I'm staying in my lane effectively, but I'm making sure my UX isn't, isn't horrible. Could you imagine using a computer today and like, this is horrible. Like, could you imagine using Windows 10 full time 
with a freaking hard drive in it. No, we can't get onto that. That no, that, no, that no. Like I don't want to open that open yeah, that wound the, up again. Yeah, yeah. But like that, I, I've yeah, done it, can, and it's can't. literally like, all right, I had to reboot because I had a crash. No problem. Reboot. Go get a coffee. Make dinner. Have dinner. Eat there. Click on like Steam or whatever. Like that's how I was playing a game. Mm-hmm. Click Steam, and leave again for ten minutes. That's not an over exaggeration. Now that didn't happen all the time, but once every couple months, once every month, once the every fact couple that weeks, at all whatever is, is unacceptable. Yeah, it's, it's unacceptable. Yeah, it's not acceptable. Yeah. So yeah. I agree with you there. That's exactly it. So, and that's why I just, it's always hard for the recommendations. Like 99% of the people that reach out to me for recommendations are looking for literally like just getting the cheapest thing that they could possibly get, like $100 for a computer. Like you can't, you, you know, can't I have $150. That, like I have, I've, I've had, I've legit had like asks, like asks of me being like, what can I get for $150? And I'm like, you got to go. I always go tell them. Kijiji. Yeah. Cra- Craigslist Kijiji every time. Yeah. Could go on Kijiji and hope for the best. Like, I don't know what you want. Like if you're going to be using it every day, it's, it's a gamble. Like you're just gambling away $150. Like it's just, you know, 50, 50, it might work. It might not. Um, but P- regardless, you, you have to classify things. And this is really brief. I don't want to go off on the big thing. You have to classify things as you have to know where your lane is for each thing. I like a lot. Of, I like tech, so I just have a lot of tech. I know I, ha- I know I have a lot of it. I have too much of it, but I just like it. That's not my, that's my thing. I don't have ten thousand dollars in clothes because I just don't care. I d- like I just do not care at all in this slightest. I don't have ten thousand dollars in furniture because I don't care. I, like you know that that's the reality of it. It's like I need a table. Okay, like I'm not gonna buy a table that's gonna cut me every time I touch it. I'm gonna I'm gonna stay in my lane. I'm gonna go. Do you have a scratch and dent model of this one? Yeah. Okay, I'll take that. Because I don't care, right? So I'll get a nice table that has a scratch in it. That's it. Easy enough. So stay in your lane, but acknowledge things. For example, like I wanted to get the Shure SM7B. If I do do that, I acknowledge that that's a luxury item for myself. And that's why I'm kind of waiting because it's like I don't necessarily need it. But this microphone I'm using right now is literally rusting. Because it's metal on the front. It is lit- it's rusting. I mean, I'm not a metal expert, so it could be discoloration or something. But it... like. <laughs> Well, I've never seen a discolored microphone, but I've like I have used this thing, so maybe I could just replace it with it with the same tier, but acknowledge I might just say to myself like I'm gonna get a luxury item this time, but because I bought a luxury item and I went a little over budget, I don't know next time I'll buy a lesser mouse or I'll uh, make my make my uh, speakers like maybe I was just gonna replace my speakers which I'm not going to but I'm gonna make it make them last another year you know I'll, I'll use them until they can't turn on anymore. I kept the monitor. They kept turning off every friggin' five minutes. I used that thing for like two years before I replaced it. So just when trying to convince people to do stuff like that, just that's what you need to do. Allocate your funds properly. Stay in your lane. Acknowledge if it's luxury, right on par or below par. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Sometimes you want luxury and you get luxury like people that buy Apple all the time. That's... Essentially buying luxury lifestyle. My my, um, but my cell phone is a is a luxury item. Yeah, I always just go luxury, I, exactly. like now they have an ultra ultra no. Well, oh, there goes two grand then. Like I know it's gonna happen. Yep. Like that's it. Too bad. That's it. Yep. <laughs> so that, those are luxury. But regardless, like okay, so for for the topic at hand, that working from home, the things you need are a computer that can do the job and not not gonna frustrate you every second. You need monitors. In my opinion, if you're a web developer, you need more than one monitor most of the time, at least two. Um, then you need also a good headset that doesn't hurt your head. That sounds okay. Like you, you don't need to be an audiophile and buy like a $5,000 headset, but something that you could put on your head and it doesn't bother you. I have a lot of really crappy headphones that literally if I wear for 30 minutes, they start, you know, like it hurts giving me pain in my, yeah, they hurt. So you don't want that. You want something that'll actually be comfortable because you're going to be using it for a long time. And the last thing, and the thing that people skimp out on a lot, just use their, you know, crappy built in stuff was the microphone. So when you're remote working, you're going to be doing calls, 100%. You're going to be ha- having calls, like you're going to have meetings, especially if you're going from office work to a remote work, you're going to have meetings over Zoom or whatever, conference calls. Invest in a decent microphone. Again, like Matt was saying, in your stay in your lane, you don't you're not a, like you don't need to invest in a studio grade microphone because you're not doing a podcast, you're not recording you're not recording music, but Invest in something like a blue snowball ice or yeah, something. Yeah, like, like the lower like, version of the blue snowball is totally yeah. acceptable for meetings. And and really and, and calls, even it's for fantastic. intro even for intro podcasting, absolutely. absolutely totally fine. I have a blue snowball, like one one step yeah. up, and it's totally fine. Yeah. 
Exactly. So that, that's the kind of thing like putting that little bit of effort into your home environment. And sometimes, again, companies might give you a stipend to do that because it works out for them. Like that, having a better communication setup for you, having a better work environment and making you more productive is actually putting money in their own pocket. Because the more productive you are, the better tools you have, the faster you can get their job done and the more effectively. So a lot of the times, if you can explain that to your em- employer, they can help you out. Um, and a microphone is 100% part of that. Because having a shitty microphone on a conference call is like one of the most annoying things you can have. Like that, the oh, the constant, like that constant, the constant you know, noise floor. Like, come on, man. Yeah, like it's ridiculous. I hate it so much, and it's not that much of an investment. Like, the, how much is the how much is the ice? I think in Canada, Canadian I think in Canada, it's about. like it's it's below a hundred. Because I think I think this one was a hundred in Canada when I bought it. I want to say it was sixty nine ninety nine. I don't know if that was on sale. Yeah. So and I've seen it. I've for ice, sure seen it. I well, okay, I shouldn't say for sure. I believe I've seen it for forty dollars on sale. Yeah, I've definitely seen them on sale for pretty cheap. Right now, it's like ninety bucks in Canada can, Canadian rupees. Wait, uh, on Snowball Amazon. Ice is ninety yeah, bucks. Snowball Ice, but maybe but, I bought it. Yeah, on, maybe I, I bought I this thing on sale. <laughs> but you can get like, you can get a bunch of different microphones. For some reason, uh, Amazon's not selling them directly anymore. I don't know why. It so could maybe be a that's COVID why. So maybe thing. who knows. You know, yeah, it could be a COVID ship, everything, but whatever. But there's many of other, plenty of other USB condenser microphones that are really good. You can do your research on them or not. I don't think we're going to link any or affiliate no, no, any, no. but regardless, like do your research on just them. Just get a good microphone. Just got to have these ones. Yeah, even for if 50 it's a good to $60, headset. you can get a really good microphone. Just, even if you're like not a gamer, but you buy a gaming a gaming headset that like sounds good, like who cares? That's also you know, okay. Like whatever. Yeah, I agree. Gaming headsets also are okay. I, I don't. I particularly. I don't really like their sound that much, but it's way better than ninety nine. It's not gonna be annoying in a meeting. No, no one's gonna be like, "Hey, yeah, is that a gaming headset?" <laughs> yeah, because then you're gonna buy a hundred dollar laptop, and then you're gonna use the hundred dollar laptop microphone, which is like a two cent microphone that you know from whatever in 90, 90 million years ago, and it's gonna sound even worse on your shitty laptop. You're, it's gonna you're gonna present yourself as not professional. And as much as you want to say like, oh, I'm doing it to save money, to be able to feed my family, whatever, it's going to be a detriment to your future career because I'm going to tell you right now, honestly, people that have bad microphones, I don't take very seriously on calls. Damn. Straight up. Look at this guy. Writing them right off. Holy frick. Yeah. I don't write them off completely, obviously. And like I listen to whatever they have to say, but like I just – I don't know. It's just annoying. Bad microphones are really annoying to me and it doesn't make sense because it's not that expensive to upgrade. There's even decent ones for like 30 bucks, I'm pretty sure. Like uh, I'm you sure do you do get, that's research. what I mean by like if, you, if you're looking yeah. for headphones and a microphone, buying a half decent headset yeah. might be the combo price you need, you know, and, and exactly. just do look up the reviews and that's it. Yeah. Some people do their yeah. Twitch just stream don't... professionally from a freaking game and headphones with a game and headset and a gaming microphone. Yeah, absolutely. And you can do that. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of my recommendation. Don't go too cheap on the main critical items of your of the right tools for your setup because it's going it's going to detriment you in the future. So next uh, tip here is change up your work environment. Sometimes uh, a lot of the time, the advantage of working from home is to be able to work from different places. And if you're living in like a house and you have a backyard, sometimes it's nice to go out there and maybe do some writing outside. Like if you have to write your emails. Maybe, you know, have some breakfast and after that, write, your, write some emails outside if you can. Uh, change up your Changing up your work environment can kind of help you be more productive during the day in ways that just sitting at a desk can't because it changes your mind, your perspective on things. Like I know for me, um, before COVID, I would go to like coffee shops once every couple of weeks uh, just to do a lot of like the administrative stuff because I I usually hate the administrative stuff, but at a coffee shop, it kind of makes it feel like, you know, especially a coffee shop that's known for a work environment. I use that kind of energy to, uh, to I fed off that and kind of did all the little meticulous tasks as fast as I possibly could to get them over with. Sometimes I would even code at coffee shops, although that was a little bit less effective because I had to get into like a deep work environment. Um but now, obviously, with COVID, I wouldn't recommend doing anything like that. Uh, I would recommend, again, outside, if you're in a condo complex, maybe on your patio, if you're... Please, please follow your you local safely. health your local yes. health professional's advice. Yeah. And hopefully, this podcast will be relevant for a while, and it'll be after COVID already, and you're listening to this. Go work in that coffee shop. 
uh, if you have that immune, like that whatever immunity built up or vaccine, whatever the heck is happening in the future. Once COVID has um, is no longer a threat to humans. Threat, yeah, yeah. Go work in like co working spaces, coffee shops. Every once like in a while, I feel like your lawyer would just like, like, wait a sec. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you're, you're you're giving the disclaimer so that we don't have to. <laughs> We don't have to get sued or anything. I don't, even though I don't think like, even if we said like, you know, do this, we can get sued. Um, regardless, we're not saying that. Uh, we're saying follow your local health guidelines. But once this is all over, try to change up your work environment as much as possible. Uh, with the caveat that like, obviously, like, don't do it every day. Otherwise, you're going to throw off your whole routine. Um, but every, like, you know, once every couple of weeks, it's completely fine to go work somewhere else. If you're more productive with the people around you, maybe a co-working place is better for you and you can, you know, schedule a couple of days a week even where you can go in there and do certain tasks. For me, co-working was good, but again, coding in a co-working space was a little bit annoying because every day would be a different desk um, in the one that I went to and the one like the tier above got you a better debt, like a, a stable desk and you could bring your own monitors and stuff, but that was a little bit more expensive for what I wanted from it. Regardless, I was only I was mainly doing administrative emails, uh, writing, or management stuff during my co working time. And and to be and that's perfectly sorry. Fine. Go ahead. Oh, right, go ahead. Sorry, but like to like even in the same home, like I'm kind of like a productivity like commercial. <laughs> I'll use my tablet. I'll use my phone upstairs. Then I'll like go and like grab like a like a TV tray, sort of like a little table. Start using my. Like, I'll use my phone in my chair, and then I'll stay in the same chair, get, like, the TV thing, the, t- the the tray, use my tablet for a bit, you know, then go into the office, use my actual desktop, want to continue working on something or watching something, so I'll, like, <laughs> use, use my tablet to watch it as I go upstairs, put my headphones in, come back to my desk, like, wire in. Like, I'm using, like, all the weird, like, productivity things that they show you in, like, the modern office. Like, I'm, like, almost like a walking commercial, but that's actually a big environment change. You know, you're lounging. Then you're like sort of like lounging, but you're leaning forward and th- or you're in the kitchen or whatever. It does actually help quite a bit. Absolutely. I, I do that too. I sometimes go to the kitchen. Again, I go to on my balcony, whatever. But uh, last tip here, and this one kind of, you know, takes everything into it. Uh, experiment with new workflows. So this one is the benefit of working from home is it allows you to do different things and you allows you to find that balance between productivity and actually liking your job and not wanting to, you know, hate, you know, waking up, hating the commute and all that, uh, get that balance. And by to do that, you have to experiment. You have to be willing to change it up and it might take you a month. It might take you two months. It might take you three months, but it's worth it because when you have that balance, when you know your productive work environment, like, you know, these are my work hours. That's one thing that you have to figure out. Um, these are the tools that I like, like the computer, the monitors. This is how I like them set up. Experiment with it. Keep keep trying new things until you're satisfied. And even when you're satisfied, you know, try a little here and there as well, just to make sure that you don't have something that you're missing. Um, then, like again, the work environment changes. I uh, change it up sometimes and see what works for you. Because sometimes you'll do it and it won't work. Sometimes you'll go to a coffee shop and be like, you know what? I'm not getting anything done. I'm not going to do this again. And that's perfectly fine because you found that out. And what that allows you to do is, again, get that balance for you to actually like your job, to get the productivity out of the, out of the day for that your employer is happy, you're happy, uh, and you can just continue working and not get burnt out as much. Whereas with the office, it's a little bit more rigid and a little bit harder to do that. Because again, you have that commute every day that you have to do. You have the structured environment of the office where you have to be at your desk for a certain amount of time or whatever. Um, and your desk is a set working space. Like you can't, you know, you can't all of a sudden bring a desk that three times the size of your desk or start, you know, moving your desk in the middle of the office for no reason <laughs> yeah. whatsoever. Like that would be hilarious. But you can't do that. Like you can't experiment as much as you could at home. So take your working from home as an advantage instead of being a hindrance to you. You do the things like take take my tips, do your own kind of analysis on it. Don't just take what I said and do exactly what I do. Do your own analysis, figure out the ones that work for you and optimize your days, make yourself happier and your work more productive. Don't, you know, bury yourself in work, obviously, but get that balance. Honestly, that's that's, that's the capstone. Mm-hmm. If I'm be, if I'm being blunt, yeah. I was going to say something, but I think I think you did it. <laughs> yeah. I think you did number 10 it's- there. <laughs> 
Yeah, I think that that's the that was my whole that was what I was building up to because was like the epicenter of it is the fact that you have the flexibility and you have the ability to try these things and you should do it. You should try. Um, but with that, let's uh, I think move on to the web news uh, this week. What we're going to talk about is the Twitch content plan. So if you haven't been around uh, the last few months or the last yeah, I guess it's been a couple months now. Uh, we started streaming or I started streaming on Twitch. Uh, every Thursday at 8 p.m., usually Eastern, I'll go on there for an hour to two hours. Uh, I've been building this app that was a D&D Monsters application using Vue.js, and it's been pretty fun. I've had some people that listen to the podcast come out. We've had some new people come out. we had some Discord members come out uh, and just chat with me, and I... I, I admit that I spend way too much time probably with the chat and I answer way too many questions, but I think that kind of works out for everyone and I'll continue kind of that path. Um, the next thing that I'm going to be doing personally, and I'll get into my content plan, is I'm going to do the next Twitch stream will be me picking my next project. Uh, so that again, that's going to be this cup, upcoming Thursday. Um and it's going to be 8 p.m. Eastern. And we're going to be just kind of talking through the different tech stacks that I want to work on, the different projects that I might want to work on. It's it's looking like it's probably going to be a portfolio. Um, I don't know if we wanted to leave that for something else. That was my that was kind of my question to you, Matt, is I know we were talking about doing like a portfolio competition. So maybe I won't do that so that we can do that at I some mean, point. I mean, you could do uh, – I was going to say you could you could put together – the like i don't know whether you're going to be showing more back-end systems but you could put together the database or something and make your own i mean this this might be ridiculous but this might work for you uh for like showing people is uh, you might be able to make your own portfolio api in which you pull your projects and your and like the when the pro like oh i pulled project one when did i do that from what was it what did it entail what skills did it entail because you could show off because like i like that isn't really critical to me like I, it doesn't matter because our our competition isn't going to be like how 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 in depth is how your tech projects. thing? Like you might just be using yeah. an API that you built, whereas I'm just going to put it on the page. <laughs> like yeah, I gotcha. Um, yeah, that's not a bad idea actually. Doing like a portfolio projects page with an API, like you make your own API where you like put it in the database and then you pull like Mike dot Mike dot project dot one or whatever you know. Yeah, yeah, whatever project I would, that I would want to put there. So yeah, I might do something like that. That's not a bad idea, actually. Uh, I was thinking of doing it with a backend, like you're saying, but probably a headless CMS. Okay. Um, either Sanity.io or Statamic. So Statamic is an interesting one. Uh, David Lindahl, one of the guests on the show a few times, has been mentioning it a lot. Uh, he on Twitter especially, like he's been pumping it up. And the reason that I kind of am gravitating towards it is a they have a free tier now, so I can try it out without paying. I think it was the $150 per project perpetual license. Um, it's not a monthly thing, which is cool and, and you know, unique compared to all the other CMSs where like you have to pay per month depending on your usage. Uh, this one is like $150 no matter how much you use that, that CMS, whatever, like it's, it's yours for the, till the end of your project, which is cool. But they do have a free tier now where you can go in and at least try it out. I don't know how generous that free tier is. So that's something that I'll be exploring probably on the stream. We'll be going in and looking at comparing the different headless CMSs and talking about them. One of the big reasons I want to go with Atomic is that it's actually built on Tailwind and Vue.js, whereas Sanity.io is built on React. So if I were to go in and try to edit Sanity, I would have to kind of go in and switch my stack to React a little bit, try to edit. Like the, it, it has a lot of configuration and is really editable, but again, I would have to go into React, which I'm not as familiar with as I am with Vue. And with, as far as I understand with Satamic, if I wanted to go in there and edit it and create my own custom functionality, uh, I can just go in with Vue and, you know, be running with that. So that's kind of why I'm leaning towards Satamic right now. Um, and yeah, maybe I will do kind of like a project page where I just, again, it'll be kind of a similar situation with my current project that I'm working on the D&D Monsters. But instead of D&D Monsters, it'll be my own API and it'll be a bunch of the projects that I'm working on. And then I'll have a projects details page if you click on the little tile, which will detail what's in the project. So that's not a bad stepping stone. So that's definitely, I'll put that on my list of things that I'm going to be considering. Uh, and with that, uh, obviously I'm going to start uh, streaming as well. Uh, I already stream actually on a gaming channel. And so I'm familiar with it enough. Uh, so... I'm going to start streaming. I'm going to start streaming some of the stuff that I sort of do. Uh, but what, so 
when I mentioned in the beginning that we're just sort of doing some growing pains as pivot pains or whatever you want to call it. But I'm going to start pivoting slightly from I'm still going to be doing client work. You know, I'm still going to get interrupted in that in that way, of course. Uh, but we're going to pivot a little bit in terms of my day to day is going to for the for the most part, have a chunk of hat in it. Uh, so we're going to sort of like lessen the amount of client work that I have to do in each given day. And we're just going to, I'm effectively treating hat as a client, I guess you could say, uh, like a, like a, a semi large client. And, you know, eventually it could become a full-time gig who knows. Uh, but I'm going to start streaming a bunch, uh, cause I don't mind just, you know, suddenly streaming some web flow. That's basically what I'm going to be hitting up. So sometime I'm hoping this week, but you know, always getting started is always the hardest thing, but I'm going to start streaming a little bit of Webflow. Uh, I've never built anything with Webflow from ground up. It's always been from template or from highly modified template or from something that already existed. So I'm going to start, um, I'm going to start that. Uh, and I'm going to obviously start publishing, uh, like, well, if, if you're not like partial to streams, we're going to, put them on YouTube as well. Just as FYI, that's for Mike and I, we have all the ones from Mike. We have a couple uploaded that are public. All of them are actually uploaded. They are just private right now. Cause we haven't named them and everything else. They're just named the default names. And so we need to push out the other three or four parts or whatever. And then there's going to be sort of like a, we're almost going to spam you with catching up with Mike. And then I'll end up, or then we'll end up like having a schedule where, where like uh, our streams show up at a certain time or something like that. Still figuring it out clearly at that point. But the point is, is that uh, the first thing we're going to be, the first thing I'm going to be streaming straight up is just going to be, we're going to be building the hat site. I want to build it. I want to build it, uh, you know, just straight up. I just want to build it right from the ground up. Uh, then we're going to get that going. We're going to probably do some content management streams and talk about just in there, whether it's a part of building the site or whatever it is, but we're going to be talking about, you know, what's going to be on the site and everything else and making sure that the CMS is structured to it and all the rest of it. And the workflow for that and all the, all, all that stuff. So there's that. Uh, we'll be talking about, we'll be talking about that. We'll be talking about the different pieces. Uh, I'm probably going to try, I'm going to try to cover a couple of things that I just find that's sort of weird with Webflow and some ways I got around it. Maybe even show how to integrate, uh, some things in there. I know for one thing is like embedding the player isn't actually as easy as it sounds. I actually had to do like a big workaround. So I'm going to show you how to do that because I've done, I've done that for people before. And, um, it's a very particular use case, but it is still something that I found people are having trouble with. And luckily somebody out there helped me. So I'm going to help, help, hopefully help you with it. And I think what we really want to do is, I mean, just right off the hop, I want to build that, start getting that. Like I want to stream the stream us building the hat site. It's accountability. You get this hat site out finally. Then, then we have the hat site out and now we have a place to dump all our content. So we put our show notes in there. We put any articles we write in there. It's ours. You know, we get to control it. We get to experiment with it. You guys get to come along with us on the journey. That's the big piece. Everyone gets to see what's going on, but I want to build other things. Like Mike and I have tons of ideas, just cool ideas. And it's always like, oh, should we do that? You know, it's always like a hit and miss. But now with the stream, it's sort of like, well, I can just stream that. And if it flops, if it flops and like two people download it, I mean, who cares? Obviously we're not going to support it if two people download it, but some people learned some stuff. You know, it was fun to do the stream. You guys got to see it. You guys get to see us building a project and whether, you know, success or fail. I just think that a stream is, is best when it's showing the natural progression of whatever it's showing rather than a produced piece. Sort of how if you're in the gaming space, you know, a let's play is, is usually structured. They cut pieces out. They cut the boring things out. They fast forward them. They, they produce it. And a stream is very much, I'm going to start doing this. Oh, my game crashed. And like, you see everything. And I, I think that that's going to be beneficial on, on uh, like for you guys. And I think it's going to be beneficial for us. It's a little bit of accountability and we're going to be able to build some cool things because one of the things that Mike and I want to do is start building templates for, uh, we want to start building templates for Webflow potentially. Uh, we want to start possibly like if, if let's say I want to start building WordPress templates. I don't know. I'm just making something up right now, but I just want to build out, build out WordPress templates. And I've never used WordPress in that way. Right from ground up. I can just go and start learning it right live. And, and you're going to, you're going to see me. I don't know when I'll jump in, but like you, you're going to see me struggle from, you know, how do I initialize PV, PHP or whatever I'm having trouble with right through like, Hey, you know, I'm calling the name and it's coming into the wrong care set. What's going on? So you're going to see everything from the very basic errors to like me not even understanding things because I don't really know much PHP to 
you know, the, the complex stuff or the specific WordPress stuff. And I think that's really critical. I think it's almost motivational and sort of a, uh, I guess it'd be a motivational booster, I suppose, where it's sort of, it's sort of a self-esteem booster, I would almost say, where you're seeing us struggle because, you know, we're not the greatest programmers in the world. I more or less do business admin now, so I'm rusty as hell, you know, and, but yet we have projects that we need to, that we want to build. And I think this is the way we're going to, this is the way that we're going to show it. Now, I, obviously I'm not going to show you our client projects. That's not going to happen. Uh, I'm not going to show you, I'm not going to like, again, all this stuff is subject to change, but I'm not going to show you our clients projects. I'm not going to show you, you know, specific security systems necessarily and that type of thing, of course, but I am going to show, you know, if, if, if I can, and I'm building a random couch site and I'm allowed to stream it, I'll probably just end up streaming it. So I'm trying to make streaming as serious as we take the podcast. And I think it you know, opens, opens us up to a new audience, opens that audience up to the podcast, uh, opens up this is sort of background noise. Whenever you're working, whenever you're commuting, well, maybe not commuting because you have to sort of watch it, but whenever you're working or whenever you're just like chilling in the evening, we're going to, you know, you can kind of come and see this. Now, my streams are more than likely going to be during the day because it'll be as a part of my work day. Now, I might be crazy and like, like I told Mike, if I get like a weird inkling, I might just stream from like 3 to 6 a.m. So I'm going to be kind of all over the place, hence is why I'm going to upload it to YouTube. But like, if I really want to work on something on the hat site just to finish it or something, it could be three, three, three to six a.m. Eastern. You know, that, 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 that's me. That could be me. But that's sort of where we're we're li- we're lying. We want we need like our current site is very draft, very first pass. We want to switch it over to Webflow right now because I'm most familiar with that. Get that going. See if we can't get into the Webflow program for templates and that type of thing. I don't. I forget what they call it. And then we can start building some templates, and then I can show or I can learn the best ways to build templates out. And then you guys can kind of come along with that journey. And then maybe you guys in the future can start building some templates as well. So that, that, that's the big thing here. Um, and, and again, like I said, all subject to change. Maybe I just hate building stuff from scratch at Webflow. Maybe that'll happen and I just don't do it. Who knows? But we'll, you'll, you'll sort of see it all live. And first thing on the, on the ticket, that hat site, we've talked about it months and months and months ago, possibly even a year ago at this point. Let's just get it done. Let's get it going. We have some cool community ideas and let's just kind of get the ball rolling and all that. So hopefully this week sometime I'll get some sort of streaming up. The Our Discord uh, pings everybody. We don't know if, we, if we're going to change that, but uh, it currently pings everybody when we're live. And even if we get rid of the ad, everybody uh, tag in there uh, that we will still have the notification. So if you want to get pinged about that certain channel, you know how to change your own Discord settings to do that. Uh, also, you can follow us on Twitch uh, at twitch.tv slash HTML, all the things. So come check us out on there. We are very close, actually, even though we've just begun. We are very close to affiliate, actually. So if you want to come in there and toss us a follow, that help us out a bunch. And come, you know, come hang out, come chat, whatever. Uh, my lighting is horrible, so I don't know if we're going to have a webcam for the first couple. Like, I'm literally in the darkness right now, and it's just my face. And the only reason why I'm lit up is because the screen is white. <laughs> so <laughs> short of me getting, like, a dollar store, like, flashlight and flash it in my face. Like, I don't really have a lighting setup at the moment. Um that you might have to invest in that i might invest in that as a tool at the low end on, on at the topic. low end because i know that yes. i'm not a professional streamer <laughs> but but yeah uh i i just love streaming actually like i told mike if this takes off and i set the stream all afternoon every single day i don't care because i i stream on wednesdays and stuff like that shameless self plug t- t- twitch.tv slash day one patch media we stream on wednesday nights um but yeah so i know that was a long rant and it's not really web news ish, but it's taking pla- place of the web news section. And I don't know if Mike has anything else to say about that, but no, I think that's it. I think you covered it really well. Again, like I, I really like streaming too, and I think it's been pretty fun. Uh, biggest surprise for me is like the chat is fairly active and lots of questions, lots of people talking to each other in the chat, and it hasn't gotten to that point where it's just like a stream of text of nonsense yet which I like, and I kind of hope it never gets to that point, although obviously we're doing something well if it does. But for now, it's it's a nice small community that's uh, very active, and we appreciate it. Yes, very much so. Um, I hope that, I hope that you know, the you guys enjoy the, the Twitch stream as well. Hope you, come and ch- hope you come and check it out. And, I mean, we're over the two-hour mark now, so I think, I'm, I think we're ready to go. I think that's enough conversation uh, for myself, unless Mike has anything else to add. Nope. Roll up the old outro. Alrighty. Well, um, 
Thank you for uh, listening, and we're going to, uh, of course, thank our uh, $3 tier patrons. So that's Sean from RabbitWorks JavaScript. Find him at YouTube.com slash RabbitWorks JavaScript. Garrick from Local Path Computing and Web Design. Find him at LocalPathComputing.com. Ryan Gatchel from Blue Black Digital. Find him at BlueBlackDigital.com. Chris from Self-Made Web Designer. Find him at SelfMadeWebDesigner.com. Tim from The Web Hacker. Find him at TheWebHacker.com. And DL Ford from DLFord.io. If you want to support us, again, come check out our Patreon. That's patreon.com slash HTML all the things. Or newly now, come check out our, our Twitch stream, twitch.tv slash HTML all the things. And I'll let our new outro sign us off. You've been listening to HTML All The Things Podcast. Web development, web design, and small business. We hope you've gotten some useful and practical information from this show. And we hope you appreciate that we talk to you like human beings. And we hope you had some fun. We'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hit us up on social media. On Facebook, Instagram, and Patreon at HTML All The Things. And on Twitter at HTML Everything. Until next time, this is HTML All The Things, signing off.